see you. Um, so we could, uh, if you can have you mute for a moment. I didn't or do I need to close the curtain?
And I guess the chair, the chair lady of leadership. Okay. okay. The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing uh, so long as they participate virtually and they will be recognized after members of the subcommittee have been recognized. Members who are participating via WebEx platform are reminded to keep uh, their video function on at all times even if they are not recognized by the chair. Members who are participating via WebEx platform are also reminded that they are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, uh, and they should mute themselves uh, both before and after uh, the time that they are allotted. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, consistent with regulations a company and accompanying HRES 965, staff uh, will uh, uh, also uh, be muting uh, members when they are not recognized. Uh, members are reminded that all House rules relating to order and decorum apply to this hybrid hearing. Uh, in addition, the chair informs members participating in person that, it, that in enforcing the order and decorum in this hearing room, the chair has the duty to protect the safety of the members. Last week, the attending physician provided the following guidance. For the U.S. House of Representatives meetings uh, in limited enclosed spaces, and this is one, such as a committee hearing room. Uh, for greater than 15 minutes, face coverings are required. Accordingly, the chair will treat uh, wearing masks as a matter of order and decorum, and all members should wear masks at all times in this room. Members who do not wish to wear masks may participate virtually through the WebEx platform. Uh, this uh, hearing is entitled capital markets and emergency lending in the COVID-19 era. And Mr. Chairman, I have a point of inquiry on, yes. on, on that. Um, it was my understanding, based on the rules, that masks were required unless you were speaking uh, and during your question period. That was my understanding of, uh, so I just want to make sure it's clear. It, is, it is the strong preference of the chair that we wear the masks even while speaking, uh, but that rule will be uh, less enforced uh, than at other times. The reason for that is uh, if you're not wearing a mask before you speak, you may not be called on in order. But once I call on someone, um, we'll rely upon your dedication to the health of yourself, but more importantly, everyone else in the room, and urge you to continue to wear your mask. Uh, you are, uh, as, as we've seen from a number of instances, more likely to spread the disease when speaking than when not speaking. Uh, so uh, I'd urge you to do so. Uh, but my tools for enforcing that are more limited. I, uh, I just thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I, I uh, to, to my members, I would advise your comfort level. And and uh, and then as we're dealing with this, much like the rules on the House floor, uh, if you're speaking, uh, I think we're uh, we're free to uh, to uh, to uh, to add to the comfort level of being uh -huh. able to deal with that. So thank you. I yield back. Okay. Uh, according to the chair, will treat wearing masks as a matter of order and decorum, and all members should wear masks. Members who do not wish to this mask, as I've said before, uh, may do so, uh, uh, may participate virtually. Um, I will now recognize myself uh, for four minutes. Um, Mr. Clayton, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're here six months from now. Uh, it has been suggested that as part of the President's decision to fire the U.S. Attorney, for the Southern District in New York uh, that you would be called upon to fill that position. I rarely quote senators because they are rarely a source of wisdom, but in this case Chuck Schumer stated, Jay Clayton can allow himself to be used in this brazen Trump bar scheme to interfere with investigations of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, or he can stand up, uh, withdraw his name from consideration, and save his reputation. Um, I don't always take advice from senators, uh, but in this case, uh, I, I would commend it to you, especially in light of the fact that uh, Senator uh, Lindsey Graham has pretty much indicated that you're with us for the duration. Uh, so keeping your name there simply weakens your uh, gravitas with regard to the SEC and doesn't allow you to reduce your commute. Um, uh, 
The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in unprecedented volatility in U.S. markets, uh, yet the markets have remained open. They are functioning. I know the chair will tell us uh, all his staff has done to achieve that result and that the SEC, Division of Enforcement and Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations have also moved aggressively to stop uh, COVID-19 based investment scams and have already suspended trading of 30 companies. Um, we're at a time of emergency. I would hope that the SEC would use its limited bandwidth to do two things. Do things that are necessary because of the emergency and do things that are bipartisan. Accordingly, I would hope uh, that you would curtail the efforts on the uh, proxy advisors rule and rules that would narrow disclosure uh, related to murder, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, today, uh, uh, we're going to be dealing with a number of bills. Among these are uh, Ms. Velasquez's bill uh, to require public companies to disclose uh, risks uh, to the supply chain disruptions and impacts and what, they might, what impact they may have on uh, their workforce. Ms. Dean's legislation to reverse uh, Fed and Treasury's decision to open Fed lending facilities only to corporations with credit ratings from certain agencies or having at least one of those certain credit rating agencies when in fact the SEC has determined that a long, longer list of agencies has expertise. Um, Ms. Wexton's bill to require disclosure of products likely to be manufactured using a, a forced waiver, uh, labor from uh, the Uyghur uh, internment camps. Uh, and this is a group, of course, that the uh, President uh, was so anxious to sell out. I don't think that should be our policy. And Mr. Meeks's legislation to temporarily suspend rulemaking uh, by federal uh, fiscal regulators unrelated to uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we will also discuss a number of issues uh, that I have legislation on, uh, along with my bipartisan co-sponsors. Among these are uh, the need for continued uh, a public disclosure of those unique risks that uh, companies uh, have because of COVID-19, the ongoing barriers to the PCAOB uh, uh, and its effort to audit the auditors and make sure that investors are protected, uh, uh, continued challenges with the flawed CECL accounting standard, and the overall push at the FASB needs to be controlled by the SEC to move from historic accounting and reporting what has happened in transactions that have been completed to moving to having the accountants uh, project what's likely to happen or determine what future values of certain assets will be. Um, and the misguided decision by Fed and Treasury to exempt uh, companies receiving taxpayer dollars from the rules we put in the Care, uh, CARES Act regarding dividend payments uh, and, and uh, stock buybacks and executive uh, compensation. Uh, and we'll also be dealing with the loan covenant issue uh, that arises at this time. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, Chairman uh, Clayton on these issues, and I will now yield four minutes to our ranking member, Mr. Huizinga. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you holding today's hearing. Capital markets and emergency lending in the COVID-19 era. I will note it's not on the Southern District of New York, and now that that box has been checked, I hope we can move along to, uh, to the work of, uh, of, of Chairman Clayton. Uh, the last several months have upended uh, the livelihood and well-being for millions of American families throughout the United States. With almost every state under stay-at-home orders, everyone has been affected by the pandemic. Not only has this affected our daily lives, but it certainly impacted our capital markets as well. Undoubtedly, they have, these have been uncertain times for American investors and market participants. During the first quarter of 2020, the pandemic caused severe economic and capital market shocks. This turmoil was evidenced by sharp price declines, yet spikes in volumes in equity markets, which closed the first quarter with their worst performance since the financial crisis. Additionally, the ultimate symbol of these unprecedented times was the March 23rd closing of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, which was the first time the floor was closed while electronic trading continued. Although we saw significant market volatility early in the crisis, I believe that mar uh, capital markets have been generally resilient. Our capital markets have undergone the toughest pandemic stress test to date, and I'm pleased to report they seem to pass with flying colors. As we are beginning to emerge from the depths of this uh, health crisis, we have a unique opportunity to carefully assess the actions taken to address the pandemic and its impacts. We should take stock of the lessons learned and how we might improve and modernize moving forward. We need to, uh, we need to find more ways to jumpstart our economy 
help grow our small businesses, reduce unnecessary regulatory costs and burdens on our public companies. We must also improve and expand access to the capital markets for both businesses and investors in order to better put their money to work. There's no doubt that many of COVID-19's impacts will be long-lasting and it will necessarily influence how America conducts business in the foreseeable future. Chairman Clayton, I look forward to hearing from you today on ways to reignite the economy, help business get back up and running, as well as uh, get Americans back to work. Not, not to mention what you often, uh, uh, often talk about is protecting Main Street investors. And we need those folks to increase savings and retirement returns for these Main Street Americans. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from you as, as we have uh, chatted in the past. Lots is happening. I'm hoping that we are able to capture some of the temporary reforms and, and streamlining as, as economists talk, reducing that friction uh, between, uh, between transactions in a way that uh, certainly keeps investors safe, uh, it facilitates the markets, and, uh, and increases the value and the importance here in the United States. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Um, at this point, I would yield to the chair of the full committee if I saw her on the screen or if staff indicated that she was available, but I instead will go to the ranking member of the full committee, and the chair of the full committee will be recognized either after the ranking member or after the witness. I now recognize uh, Mr. McHenry for one minute. Sure, and I'm happy to take her time, but not her perspective. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Clayton, for being here. Um, I know they're exciting, there's exciting news uh, about you um, and what the Securities and Exchange Commission is doing, so I'm glad we can talk about those things here today. Um, I commend your leadership and the Commission's diligence um, during these tough times. The, the constant, focused work that you all have been about is commendable. This gives assurance to markets and to the American people that our government can actually function even in a time where we have to be socially distant. So we need to ensure regulators like the SEC are focused on policies to make our market stronger, more attractive, and more competitive to see our way through this economic challenge born out of this health crisis. I know the Commission has made a lot of progress on proposals to stimulate the, uh, the economy and economic growth and prioritize targeted reforms to address the current needs related to the virus. So thank you for your leadership, thank you for being here, and thank you for your good work. Thank you. Again, I'll reserve the one minute for the chair of the full committee, and uh, today we welcome uh, the testimony of our distinguished wish witness, Jay Clayton, chairman of the SC Securities and Exchange Commission. Chair Clayton uh, has served as chair of uh, the SEC since 2017, and during that time he also has served as a member of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Council, and the Financial uh, Stability Board clearly a package of responsibilities that exceeds in interest anything else that he's considering doing. Uh, Chair Clayton has testified before this committee before, and I will not provide uh, future uh, uh, more of an introduction. The witness is reminded that your oral testimony be limited to five minutes. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. You're now recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Sherman, uh, Ranking Member Heisenga, members of the subcommittee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Before I begin discussing the work of the Commission, I'd like to address briefly recent news regarding my potential nomination to be the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. I have a long-held deep respect for the work of the Southern District, which is recognized throughout our nation and internationally for enforcing the law and pursuing justice without fear or favor. My deep personal respect is largely the result of many years working with the Southern District and its distinguished alumni including senior personnel at the SEC. I recognize that the nomination process is multifaceted and uncertain. It is clear the process does not require my current attention. In short, I am fully committed to and focused on my role at the SEC. I could not be more proud of the work of my colleagues over the past three years on behalf of Main Street investors and our markets. There is much more to accomplish in an environment that emphasizes a commitment to respect, diversity, inclusion, and opportunity for all, and I look forward to continuing to lead the Commission. Today, my testimony will focus solely on the work of the SEC, in particular the SEC's important work in responding to the effects of COVID-19. Our efforts have focused first and foremost on the health and safety of our employees and all Americans. Since early March, the agency has remained fully operational in a mandatory telework posture, 
thanks to the dedicated women and men of the agency who have risen to the occasion, demonstrated flexibility and resiliency, and proven why their work is so important to Main Street investors and our markets. In these times of economic stress and market volatility, brought about by our collective, unprecedented health and safety response to COVID-19, the Commission has focused significant resources in, on ensuring that our markets continue to function as expected, facilitating timely decision-useful disclosure and maintaining our enforcement, examination, and investor protection efforts. We've worked closely with our fellow regulators over the past few months, and I believe our collective efforts to preserve the flows of credit and capital in our economy has significantly mitigated the potential economic consequences of COVID-19. I would be remiss here if I did not mention the prompt, decisive action of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and Congress. From my vantage point, these efforts were necessary and have had their intended stabilizing and other effects. Here I note that despite the extraordinary volumes and volatility we have seen over the past few months, the pipes and plumbing of our securities markets have functioned largely as designed, and importantly, as market participants would expect. We are continuing to monitor market prices, capital flows, liquidity, and availability of credit in our efforts to assess the functionality and resilience of our capital markets. We've been closely engaged with our fellow authorities and market participants in this regard and have provided targeted relief and guidance where appropriate. We've also been assisting issuers in fulfilling their obligations to provide materially accurate and complete disclosures and have urged both corporate and municipal issuers to provide investors with as much information as practicable regarding their current and anticipated financial and operating status. In addition, we've maintained our strong enforcement and investor protection efforts, especially in the area of COVID-related fraud and misconduct. For example, the Commission has issued over 30 trading suspensions and brought a number of enforcement actions alleging fraud based on COVID-related claims. Finally, while the agency is engaging on numerous COVID-19 initiatives, we've also continued our traditional mission-oriented agency functions, including rulemaking, investor outreach, and others. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify about the work of the women and men of the Commission, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, we do have a minute available to the chair of the full committee, but I'm told that, uh, and this does surprise me, that she would prefer that I not yield her a minute. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, nodding, and Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Yes. Um, so my understanding is the second vote has just been called. How? What is? Can you lay out for the uh, for the members and for the witness your intention of how uh, how it, we're going to be? It is our that? intention to keep this hearing going. Uh, that members will leave uh, uh, when their uh, appropriate time is to vote. Uh, the chair will leave, and I know that a number of my colleagues are here with names that are uh, uh, different parts of the alphabet, and uh, so we will just keep going. Um, but uh, I realize that there'll be a vote, uh, maybe two, that interrupt our proceedings. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, Small business, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, very important. We just adopted the probably the most popular program we're involved in, the PPP program that is going to cost the federal government half a trillion dollars, well worth it. Um, but there, it is important that, small, that we do everything possible that small business can get capital in ways that don't cost the federal government money. As you know, I remain concerned about the inclusion of uh, business development companies in the SEC's acquired funds, fees and expenses, that's the AFFE rule, has had the unintended effect uh, of B uh, DCs uh, being excluded from many major indexes. This has harmed their ability to uh, raise capital and harmed their ability to fund small business. Uh, Mr. Stivers and I have introduced legislation to fix this, but I know you're working to address it as well in the proposed uh, fund of funds rule. Are you confident that the SEC will solve this problem in a way that BDCs will uh, uh, be included in these indexes? Um, inde index inclusion is not something that we can mandate, but I am confident that the women and men in our investment management division um, are aware of this issue. Um, we have been looking at that treatment, um, and I think that in fee disclosure, um, let me just say this. In fee disclosure, 
comprehensive uh, improvement is appropriate. And if you look at our regulatory flexibility agenda, we have both fund of funds and investor experience on that agenda. Uh, I intend to finish those um, rulemakings and proposals before the end of the fiscal year. And uh, I expect AFFE um, modernization, I'll call it, uh, will be addressed therein. You can't mandate inclusion of indexes, but you can create a rule that you know will have a certain effect on inclusion in indexes. Uh, I think small businesses are perhaps even more important uh, to our economy than REITs that already enjoy uh, a, role, uh, a role that includes them. Uh, the second question is about uh, electronic uh, delivery. Uh, I'd uh, like to hear from you your next steps in evaluating electronic delivery of investor documents. Is the SEC looking at expanding electronic delivery for documents beyond the shareholder reports? And as my colleagues have heard me say, if you mail it to me, I'll lose it. If you email it to me, then if some witness in this room is particularly boring, I can look at it uh, on my iPad uh, while I'm in this room, but much more likely because we only have interesting witnesses here. Um, uh, I, when I have a spare minute somewhere, I can find it. Uh, so, um, and uh, by, by uh, searching for emails from that company. So, um, where are we on electronic delivery? Uh, let me say that this. To be, my perspective on this um, has been shaped by the response that we've needed to do um, as a result of the COVID situation. It, it is. Uh, can you speak into the microphone? I'm Especially sorry. we have people participating yeah, remotely. My, my, my response is, um, and, and my view on this has been further shaped by the work we have done in this COVID environment. Uh, it is clear that we live in an electronic communication world. Um, let me say that I am of the view that anyone who wants paper should be able to get paper. But what this this period has shown us is the importance of electronic delivery and the effectiveness of electronic delivery. Okay. Now I want to address the fact that ch companies based in China and I think also Belgium uh, are being traded on our stock exchanges, but the investors don't get the protection of the PCAOB auditing their audit. Um, uh, Senators uh, Kennedy and Van Hollen uh, in the Senate and uh, uh, Gun, uh, myself and Mr. Gonzalez here in the House have put forward uh, legislation. Uh, I hope that we derive legislation that achieves uh, an important goal, and that is if the audit is one, you know, only 20 percent, 30 percent not subject to PCAOB, that that is allowed. But when you start having an audit that is more than that, you're asking company, uh, people to make investments and I would all, uh, without that protection, and if you're going to invest in, you know, this is Investor Protection Committee, uh, so I, uh, I look forward to working with you to make sure those who invest in American stock exchanges are protected. And I would also hope that in evaluating whether to uh, impose uh, uh, the requirement in measuring what portion of the audit is unavailable to the, uh, to the PCAOB, that you would not look at audit hours Mm -hmm. because I want to make sure that there's no reason to change the numerator, change the denominator by having auditors do more or less. Right. We want more auditing and then we want the auditors being audited. So I look forward to working with you on that and uh, I will now yield uh, uh, five, uh, well I will now recognize the gentleman from Mis Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, I was going to say that, uh, <laughs> for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and it seems we, uh, we may have swapped uh, notes and questions here. My, uh, my per two, first two questions were exactly about the digitization efforts and uh, assessing the, uh, the, the impacts on business continuity plans and make permanent changes to investor preferences, and I think you answered that with, if you want paper, you should be able to get paper. Um, to expand a little bit on uh, where the chair was going on, uh, on the PCAOB, um, would you, first of all, uh, would it make sense to make clear that the SEC has full rulemaking authority under the bill to ensure that multinational corporations doing a small amount of business uh, in an uh, uninspectable jurisdiction are not intentionally caught up in the bill? So uh, I, the, the question is, what scope of authority would we have in writing the uh, regulations yes. um, to implement this bill? I think as the, uh, we've said, as, as the bill stands, we, be, we believe we have the authority to do it. Of course, 
the more the more intent you express, the better. But uh, as it stands, we believe we could um, implement it. But if you have further nuances, further direction, we have all, we're of course welcome. Yeah, I just really wanted to find out whether you felt that uh, you had the proper tools to be able to move forward on that. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, as a small privately held business, uh, as we see small privately held businesses struggle to stay afloat during these unprecedented times, some will be looking to sell their business or be forced to close their doors altogether. Uh, as you know, I have a bill, HR 609, which would allow these small businesses the opportunity to be sold to the next generation of entrepreneurs while also protecting good paying jobs. Uh, um, I, I hope you would, uh, would join me in supporting this, uh, and I believe we need to pass this bill to help these struggling small business owners. Are there some things that we can do to make sure that, that those small privately held businesses aren't caught up and treated like a publicly traded large company? Um, yes, we, we, have an, we, we have an office, thanks to Congress, uh, the advocate for small business policy, and I, I'm so happy with their work that they've been doing because they, they've, uh, their job is to affirmatively recognize that small businesses are vastly different in their capital needs, in their, in their operations, from our public companies. Uh, just in response to COVID, uh, we've adjusted the crowdfunding rules. Now, all with, all, let me just say, all without any degradation in investor protection, but to, but to serve smaller businesses and to understand that the, the rules for them raising capital and access to capital should be different from the public company rules. And they, and they shouldn't require hundreds of lawyer hours to get through. Well, and I believe that there's been uh, the, the, the uh, uh, sections within the law, the bar have supported this in the past. We have seen a number of, uh, a number of efforts. I've passed this bill through the House unanimously, and then it became partisan somehow. But nonetheless, uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can count on your support and help in exploring that. Um, you've also testified uh, before this and other committees several times during your tenure as SEC chair. Uh, members of both parties on both sides of the Capitol have raised the issue of victims of the Stanford Ponzi scheme in nearly all of these ha uh, hearings. You've indicated a willingness to be helpful to these victims. Over 21,000 of them, including several of my constituents, have been waiting over 11 years. Can you give them an update on the status of the Commission's efforts to help them get their money back? So let, let, let me say this. Um, the status, if you look at the status of the Stanford victims, you can't reach any conclusion other than there was a failure in the system. This, everything that went on here had the veneer of legitimacy, yet at the end of the day, they haven't gotten much money back. And we have dedicated substantial resources to trying to help them get more back. I, you know, they're never gonna be anywhere close to whole. In fact, they're never going to be anywhere close to uh, anything close to whole, anything satisfactory. Um, but we are, we are working on it. We, we are looking at the, re the remaining claims that they have and consistent with our authority um, and, our, and our independence as an agency, trying to help them as much as possible. In, in the last 45 seconds, I want you to talk about the trajectory of our overall economy, the health of our markets, where we're going, and, and your optimism on that or pessimism. So, so Look, here's, here's where we are. We have been able to stabilize our capital markets and the flow of credit in our economy, thanks to the great work of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and in conjunction with this body. Um, we're still in a period of uncertainty. We're gonna go, from my perspective, we're gonna go into second quarter earnings. We're gonna find out a lot about how companies are operating. Hopefully what we're seeing is companies adjusting and, and continuing to increase their ability to operate. We're gonna see that from public companies. You know, to the extent that filters down to private companies, that's terrific. But we do, we do need to do what we can to keep, keep the economy going as we learn more about how to deal with the virus operationally and socially. That's as quick an answer as I can give you. But, you know, we're, we've done well. We've got work to do. Thank you. I yield back. And, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to excuse myself because I'm about five minutes late for my vote section. So I, I will turn it over I, to I understand. the ranking member. And uh, the S's will come up in the alphabet soon. I want to assure the witness that I am getting notes from staff as to how to conduct the hearing, but I am not using this iPad to review the investor wow. disclosure materials <laughs> from any of my portfolio companies. If, if, With, if, we, had, if we had addressed AFFE, you, you would, though, right? <laughs> I, I promise you not while you're here. I now recognize uh, the distinguished chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Waters. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate um, 
uh, the opportunity to be here with you today at this hearing. Uh, Chairman Clayton, in the middle of uh, the night last Friday, Jeffrey Berman, uh, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, was forced out of his position by President Trump and Attorney General Barr. The Attorney General subsequently announced that President Trump intended to nominate you as Mr. Berman's replacement. Their actions appear to be a continuation of President Trump's efforts to squash any attempts to hold him and his enablers accountable. As you know, the Southern District of New York has been instrumental in conducting independent investigations into President Trump's associates and the Trump Organization and is currently investigating Deutsche Bank, an institution with long and substantial financial ties to President Trump. In light of these past actions, I am deeply concerned that while your nomination to this important post is pending, President Trump and Attorney General Barr may try to interfere with your ability to independently and effectively oversee the Securities and Exchange Commission and serve as Wall Street's cop on the beat during a global health pandemic that has caused one of the worst financial crisis of our lifetimes. Do you plan to continue serving as chair of the SEC while you await your confirmation? Uh, chair, Chairman Wabers, um, as, as I mentioned in the opening statement, um, I don't think that matter requires my attention at this time. I'm sorry, would you speak up, please? I'm sorry. Um, I, don't, I don't think that matter requires my attention at this time, and I expect to continue to devote my full attention to the commission. Um, so you will continue to serve as chair of the SEC while you await the confirmation. You will not step down. You will not step aside. They will not have someone uh, to take your place in any shape, form, or fashion that you know about. Right, right. Let me just say where I sit right now, and uh, and this is this is not the where I sit right now. This is not the time to decide about the nomination, not the nomination. I'm here as the chairman of the SEC. As I look at it, there's no. Uh, there, there, there's no need for me to pay any attention um, to the nomination at this time. I am fully committed to being the chairman of the SEC. And of course, that would not be your decision, and I'm um, not asking you if you are making that decision. I'm basically wanting to know, have anybody else said to you uh, that you would not be serving as chair while you await confirmation. Have anyone said that to you? Did the president, did Attorney Barr say that to you? Anybody? No, and, and, and look, I, I, I have checked this matter with our ethics office and the like. I intend to continue to serve as chairman of the SEC and devote my full attention to my duties as chairman of the SEC. Thank you. Will you commit today to recuse yourself from any and all matters before the SEC that directly or indirectly involve President Trump which may create the appearance that your actions serve as a special favor to President Trump in order to obtain a position that President Trump and Attorney General Barr have highly politicized. Um, I, I'm going to continue to do what I've, what I've always done at the SEC, which is um, pursue all matters with independence and consult with ethics on any issues that would um, give the appearance of not having independence. But I continue to operate as I have. Thank you. And so that's a yes. Let the record show uh, that you have answered in the affirmative. Um, let's see if we have time here for one more question. Chairman Clayton, at the onset of the crisis, I called on you and other financial regulators to immediately halt the adoption of all rulemakings not directly related to addressing the unprecedented health and financial crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic. I made it clear that 100% of the SEC's resources should be dedicated to protecting investors and U.S. capital markets during the pandemic. I was also clear that it would be unacceptable for the SEC to use this crisis to justify regulatory rollbacks of important investor protection regulation. Yet, as I outlined in my letter to you this week, I continue to see the SEC under your leadership engage in deregulatory rulemakings that expand private markets, that the state securities regulators have testified are rife with fraud. 
This proposal would limit the amount and reliability of information investors rely on at a time when markets are experiencing the highest levels of volatility since the 2008 financial crisis. Another proposal would prevent many small shareholders from seeking to reform and modernize the companies they own, included by making it harder to propose increasing board diversity, pay workers a living wage, taking seriously climate change, or make changes to adapt the post a pandemic world. So, have you paid attention to uh, what we are concerned about in the relationship to not using this as a time to do deregulation? Well, what I can say is it's fine. You can we, our regulatory agenda um, has been Chairman. public. Um, we are continuing to pursue our regulatory agenda. Uh, we're doing so in a very open way. Um, we are continuing to take comment and engage with people. And uh, on those areas where investor protection, the, my the, aim has the time, been. The time has expired, unfortunately. I'll, um, OK. You, you OK letting me finish? Thank you. Thank you. We'll follow up. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman, uh, the full committee ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Sure. Uh, so, Chairman Clayton, as I uh, as I've written to you about um, harmonizing the, 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 the choppiness of regulations within the Securities Exchange Commission, I think this is something that's been needed for quite a long period of time. But I wrote to you specifically about regulation crowdfunding. Um, this is a, an issue that I've worked on for a decade. Um, especially now, I think we need to help small businesses um, uh, and, and we need to help small businesses in a variety of ways, not just with lending, but the opportunity to raise uh, 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 other forms of debt, um, as well as, uh, as, as uh, you know, uh, do capital raises um, for, for equity as well. So, um, I, so I wrote to you about this, specifically about uh, special purpose vehicles and increase the, increasing the offering limits. Uh, so I just wanted to see if you would elaborate on uh, the comments you've received and uh, when, when, the, when this looks like you'll finalize the rulemaking. Um, I, I don't have a specific um, time frame for that, but um, I, I, it is on our agenda to finish uh, sometime around the end of the fiscal year. I intend to stick to our agenda. Uh, what we are trying to do, if you don't mind me taking a few minutes, is if you're, if you're, let's just say you're a small or medium-sized company and you're looking to raise capital, you've got to weave your way through a patchwork of six or seven different types of exemptions, including regulation right. and crowdfunding. And you, know, you, you need a PhD in securities law to do it. Uh, what we want to do is basically streamline that process without in any way degrading investor protection. Right. In fact, so hopefully increasing investor protection. Let's get rid of all that cost. Um, while maintaining investment. So, so in some respects, like with regulation and crowdfunding, we have a more onerous uh, uh, capital raise for $50,000 than mm -hmm. we do for $50 million. And so that doesn't make sense in terms of a cost burden for uh, uh, the protection of the investor, the clarity of information for the investor. So right-sizing those things so there's a, there is a, a gradual change in regulatory cost and oversight based off the raise. So instead of having uh, arbitrary breakpoints to, uh, to, to smooth those things out, is that, is that the focus of your work? Yes, that's a fair, that's a fair summary. And so what, what are the benefits? What, what, what do you think we'll get uh, as a benefit if this is done and uh, it, 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 it successfully? So a, a hopeful benefit is right now our, our most acute problem is for companies getting started raising Two, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Generally, you know, that's a, that's achievable through people, friends and family, the like. Trying to take that company from that size up to a twenty-five million dollar company is extremely difficult. Once you get to twenty-five million dollars, you have institutional investors who are sophisticated, bring them in, and the like. It is in that that gap from pick your number, five hundred thousand, a million, two hundred, you know, two million up to 50 million, where there's a tremendous amount of choppiness uh, and access to capital could be better um, with investor protection. Lim we, you know, we can limit investment size. We can, do, we can do a bunch of things, 
but it's too choppy where it is now. Okay, and, and I commend the work that you have focused here. It is, it's been due for, for decades at the SEC. Um, and I think that was how uh, some of the poor implementation of the JOBS Act that, that you can remedy and make clear uh, the intention of Congress here. So I want to highlight uh, also um, on ESG. Um, we had a recent panel before this committee. Uh, the, the head of uh, sustainability at BlackRock said there was, quote, an overabundance of ESG data. And the strong majority of ESG data is not connected to materiality. So, uh, which, which is a fundamental foundation of our disclosure framework. So, given the vast amounts of data and questionable utility for at least some, if not most companies, do you think it would be appropriate for the Commission to dictate a single ESG scoring system for every pump, uh, public company using that data? Um, I, look, I've been very, that's coming at it one way, coming at it a different way. I've been very clear that I think a single ESG metric doesn't make a lot of sense. When you take qualitative metrics that have a degree of subjectivity and then personal preference, so just one of those has a, a fair amount of ambiguity in it, and then you combine them together uh, to come up with one score. I, I kind of, uh, you know, I love, I love economist Ken Arrow won the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, showing that when you try to rank like that, uh, it doesn't work out very well. Okay, so likewise, with the coronavirus, um, do you think there's an appropriate one-size-fits-all disclosure requirement uh, for risk related to the coronavirus? Look, what we're seeing around coronavirus, and I gotta commend our staff, because we've, we've gotten out there and tried to give companies as much guidance as we can on how to disclose around um, the effects of, of corona and our response. And it, it, it's vastly different from company to company. Um, so, so no, I mean, some companies, some companies have benefit in some ways, some companies are completely shut down, some companies have uh, liquidity problems, others don't, uh, operational issues. Our principles-based system has proven itself through the res this response. And, and, you know, second quarter earnings season is gonna be the same way. Well, thank you. Thank you for your statement. Thank you for your work. You're back. I now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you, and thank you for being here today, Mr. Clayton. I, I want to address the issue that is on everyone's mind, the scandal in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, which is in my home district. The office has several open investigations involving President Trump, his company, and his close associates, including Rudy Giuliani. There have been press reports that President Trump was very unhappy about the Southern District's decision to investigate his friends. And then on Friday night, Attorney General Barr released a statement falsely claiming that the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District, Jeff Berman, had stepped down and announcing that the President intended to nominate you as his replacement. Of course, we now know that the Attorney General was lying. Mr. Berman had not agreed to step down, and when he refused to step down, the President fired him. This episode was extremely troubling to many of us and suggests that the President fired a U.S. Attorney for refusing to follow his directions on criminal prosecutions. That would be a blatant abuse of power and should be unacceptable to everyone. Now, Chairman Clayton, you and I have been, had a really very productive relationship, even though we don't always agree. But I have to ask you some questions about this episode and your involvement. First, when did you first discuss the Southern District job with the President or the Trump administration? And who did you discuss it with? Uh, Attorney General Barr? Look, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here as the Chairman of the SEC. Uh, to discuss the work of the SEC. What, what, I, what, I, what I can say is that, as I said in my opening statement, the, I, want, I need to go back to New York. We're both from New York. Okay, but I, I was just asking for a timeline. When, when did you discuss it? Just give me the approximate date, the this, timeline. This, the, what I want to say mm -hmm. is, this is something I've been ta talking about for a while, consulting with people as to whether 
this would make sense for me to continue in public service. This was first raised um, to the President and the Attorney General last weekend. It's something that I had wanted to do. Um, and they, they first became aware of it last weekend. Okay. Thank you. And did you know that Mr. Berman did not want to leave his job in the Southern District when you agreed to accept the nomination? In other words, did you know he was going to be fired to make room for you instead for the job? Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into that here. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. If you are eventually confirmed by the Senate for this job, would you commit to recusing yourself from all of that office's current investigations into President Trump and his associates. Here, here's what I'm going to say. That's, that's a process that's way down the road. Whatever, in my current position and in any position I take, I commit to doing it independently, without fear or favor, and in the pursuit of justice. And there, but, there's nothing. But that's, excuse me, back. I, I'm sorry, that's not what I was asking. I was just asking for a commitment to recuse yourself, should you be appointed, from the investigation involving the president or any of his associates. Because I have to say, the circumstances of Mr. Berman's firing was very suspicious and raises a lot of questions about whether the president is interfering in ongoing criminal investigations. So I personally think the American public deserves a clear answer on whether you will recuse yourself from these very sensitive investigations into the president and his associates. So I'm asking a very simple question. Will you commit right here to recusing yourself from these investigations? The, that, that position and that process is something that is um, separate and doesn't need, doesn't need my attention. What I will commit to do, and what I commit to do in my current job, is to approach the job with independence and to follow all ethical rules. Well, I understand that you don't want to talk about this right now, but I think it's important that the American people right now know these answers. Because if you're not going to be independent, and the way to be independent is to recuse yourself, if you're not going to be independent, then we need to know so that someone else can be nominated. We need independence. Understood, and I, I, commit to, I commit to independence. I recognize the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chair, and I thank you for joining us today in person, uh, Chairman Clayton, to discuss U.S. capital markets during this pandemic. And I just want to say, for the record, I have always and worked very closely with you in your office and found you to be uh, a, a person of incredible integrity and character and highest of ethics. So I, I want to thank you for that. I am sure that you'll con continue to comport yourself in, um, in such a way. I have uh, great confidence in you. Chairman Clayton, despite the, the challenges of the coronavirus, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the Commission is hard at work looking to improve our, our markets. Can you please describe recent proposed changes to your equity market structure and where you think improvements will be most valuable for in the investing public, uh, specifically Main Street investors that I have caught, fought for so passionately uh, for the past eight years in Congress. So um, thank you. Our, our equity market structure has become incredibly complex. Um, for just to level set everyone, virtually all trading, I, I can almost emphatically say all trading is electronic. It's done in, in nanosection seconds, um, and, it's, and it's complex. And our job at the SEC is to make sure that what you pay for trading, and it ultimately filters down to our long-term investors, is fair and reasonable. And we're looking at both infrastructure and governance of data plans and the way data is distributed to those who trade in our markets mm -hmm. to try and make sure that that aspect drives fair and reasonable pricing. Uh, thank you. Um, Chairman Clayton, I'm, I'm also, I'm worried about the risks of fraud, fraud stemming from, uh, from the coronavirus. We saw during the, 20, or the 2008 financial crisis a rise in 
investment scams that take advantage of the extreme kind of volatility in, in the stock market that we've, we've seen. And I am deeply concerned about, uh, about uh, the seniors in my district, mm -hmm. those that are saving for their retirement uh, sec security. I'm concerned about these scammers that are out there. Can you describe what the commission is seeing in terms of coronavirus-related fraud and uh, scams and, and, and what the commission is doing in its examination and enforcement efforts to reduce these kinds of uh, frauds? Unfortunately, we are seeing um, corona-related fraud. We're seeing people tout products um, that they say they have, testing that they say they have, um, and then trying to pump up the value of their stock. Or, or in private placements, um, we're seeing some of that. And our enforcement staff is being extremely proactive in looking at these um, claims. And if there are substantial indicia of, of fraud or misconduct, uh, bringing trading suspensions and, and eventually actions. Um, what, what, I, what I can say to investors is, you know, deal with professionals. Let, let, let's deal with professionals, bro broker dealers, investment advisors, um, if you're at all doubtful about any of these. Known, known entities, known entities, those that you've worked with before uh, uh, and such, because we've seen it quite on the uprise. We certainly saw it in 2008, and it's something of deep concern to me, to the retail investor, and especially um, our most vulnerable seniors that could lose everything that they have they put their life into. So it's a great concern to me. I'm encouraged, like everyone, to see that the Commission remains committed to its regulatory agenda during the pandemic. The SEC is under your leadership, has made great progress on a number of proposals that will remove unnecessary regulatory burdens on businesses and streamline the flow of, uh, the flow of capital, mm -hmm. the capital that we need so desperately right now to stimulate economic recovery. I know you've been giving us some updates on what you've got in the queue here. Very pleased to see that the vocal, Volcker rule was finalized today. Um, and uh, any other brief update on the progress of the Commission's efforts, uh, especially on things like uh, to harmonize the exempt securities offering framework and uh, the proposal to modernize framework for fund valuation practices and such. I, I think that that comment period ends on July 21st or something. So any kind of a quick update would be uh, great. We, we, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to conclude, um, all, if not all items, virtually all items on our regulatory agenda, including um, the uh, what I want to say is the harmonization of that, of that exempt offering framework. Right. And bringing transparency uh, to a number of places where transparency is needed. And that's, that, I'm excited that, the, the women and men of the SEC, through, the, through a telework posture, responding to all of these events, the fact that they've been able to continue um, with our defined agenda and do so in an incredibly professional way, uh, I just, I can't say enough good things about them. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I yield back to the chair. Mr. Himes is, Mr. Himes is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Clayton, thank you for being here. Uh, I am sorry that you are caught up in this series of events which have raised questions that Mrs. Maloney articulated. I'm particularly sorry that uh, this has had the effect of calling into question either explicitly or implicitly your integrity, your independence, and your reputation. Uh, we've known each other for some three decades and worked on a lot of things together. And if I were a senator uh, contemplating your confirmation, I would, have, uh, I would do my job and look at your qualifications, your history, and your philosophies, but I would absolutely have no questions whatsoever about your reputation, your independence, or your integrity. But I'm not a senator, for better or for worse. Um, speaking of integrity, uh, Chairman, um, I was delighted to see your statement of June 22nd, 2020, the SEC and the Justice Department's Antitrust Division sign a historic MOU. Uh, the purpose of which apparently is to enhance competition in the securities industry. My suspicion is that this MOU was signed because both entities had some areas of investigation in mind, and I wonder if you might share with us uh, areas that this new joint venture or cooperative enterprise might be looking at. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Um, and uh, I, what I want to do is, investigation may be a loaded word. Um, I don't want to imply that we're investigating anybody together. Um, what we, what we have been doing, uh, and I greatly appreciate uh, our friends at the uh, Antitrust Division, we have been working together on a number of items. They have, they have people with great expertise, 
We oversee complex markets. Um, they're, they're able to help us with some of these issues. Um, and we're able to help them. We have, we have deep expertise in how our markets operate, and we've been sharing that with them. The MOU formalizes that relationship. Um, you know, no, no secret, I, I expect to be completed with this job at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of the term. And uh, I think Mr. Delarim is a, of, a, of a similar, and we want to formalize that really powerful relationship. So, so just because I have very limited time, uh, to date, no particular areas of possible uncompetitive behavior have been contemplated? Uh, well, I, well, we don't talk about pending investigations, um, but I just want I don't want I don't want the people to think that this is somehow um, anything more than continuing the cooperation that we've had um, ac across our um, across our respective agencies and divisions. Um, I think you know what I'm going to say next, because we've had this conversation a couple of times. Um, just for kicks, I printed out again <laughs> the pricing for initial public offerings in the middle market. This blue bar you see here shows almost perfect uh, clustering at 7% as gross spread for IPOs in the middle market. Uh, we've talked about this a lot before. Uh, I seek unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to make this part of the record. Without and. Um, Again, it is just a blue bar showing that middle market IPOs are priced at 7%. The price of a flight from New York to LA moves around a lot. The price of a gallon of gas, the price of an apartment for a month in DC moves around a lot because it's a competitive market. I don't know if 7% is too much or too little. I'm just blown away by the fact that it never varies from 7%. Is that perhaps an area that uh, this new uh, cooperation with the Justice Department might take a look at? Let, let, me, say, let me say this. That's the kind of thing that our cooperation, um, I, I think, would lead to um, better analysis. Okay, I appreciate that, and um, I, I will probably not let that particular horse die anytime soon. Um, but I do want to ask you about one other thing. Um, uh, February 14th, 2020, um, statement on uh, adding more stock price information to market data feeds. You said, both the content and the technologies used to collect, consolidate, and disseminate market data have lagged meaningfully behind proprietary data products and systems offered by the exchanges. The general public watching this doesn't know what that means, I suspect. So correct me if I'm wrong, but what you meant there was that exchanges sell much more robust information about the nature of trading markets than is available to the public who does not purchase that information. Is that fair to say? That's a fair way to say it. Okay. So, apart from the fact that one is illegal and the other is legal, apparently, what's the difference between my paying a corporate insider for more robust non-public information about a corporation and a trading entity paying an exchange for non-public information? Uh our law requires uh, trading and, and whatnot for us to look at what's being done and if it's fair and reasonable. And one, one, of, one of the questions that we have is, I'm gonna use my hands to describe what you did. If here's the publicly available data, and we started here with, with the robustness of privately available data, what we, what we have is an increase like this. And that gap, we have to look at and decide whether it continues to be fair um, to trade under those circumstances and whether people can comply with um, their obligations. So there is some gap at which you would judge it to be unfair between that which you pay for and that which you get publicly? It's a very good question, yes. That's a very good question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing. Uh, Chairman Clayton, thanks for being here. and. Uh, Good luck in your future stuff, but I'm excited about what you've been doing at the Securities Exchange Commission, and I want to say thank you for the work you've done to make uh, rules that make sense and give, that give investors more information. Thank you so much. I do want to follow up on something the chairman brought up. Chairman Sherman talked about the um, acquired fee, fund fees and expenses rule, AFFE. Uh, obviously, it was built for mutual funds, not companies that have operating expenses. And so those expenses for business development companies make it look like they're eating things up with fees, but they're really operating expenses. So when you have list equities, you don't have them talk about their operating expenses. It's the expenses that deal with their investors and that investors see. So I, I am hopeful and I know that Mr. Sherman and I have a bill. We will pass it if we have to, 
I, I believe you can fix this. I know you can fix it. You're already working on it. And uh, I hope you fix it and we don't have to pass our bill, but I, um, I'm not gonna back down from passing our bill because I think it's really important. This ultimately impacts middle market and small business companies in my district and all around our country because they get less access to capital mm -hmm. as a result of a rule that was built for mutual funds and is now applied to a company that essentially has operating expenses and those have to be disclosed and make it look like there's too many fees. So uh, please take care of it, but if you don't, don't worry, we will. Okay. So um, th that was the first thing I wanted to um, bring up. And uh, you know, the other thing that I wanted to chat a little bit about is the um, statistical, the national statistical rating uh, organizations, uh, national recognized statistical rating organizations in our SROs. Uh, you know, a number of our committee members have expressed some concern that uh, the Fed's emergency facility arbitrarily chose winners and losers in, in our SSOs. Uh, th that's a real concern to me. I, I think we need to make sure that uh, everybody has access to, um, to these um, new facilities that are coming up. And so, you know, you're the primary regulator. Has the SEC been consulted by the Federal Reserve on the subject of rating agencies? And uh, if not, have you offered any information uh, that can help them understand uh, how they can um, decide uh, a way to choose rating agencies that is not based on some arbitrary uh, decision or some uh, decision that, that doesn't actually look at the health and quality of those in our SSOs? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, we are in dialogue with uh, the Federal Reserve ac across the programs and the use of rating agencies and using the data that we, providing them the data that we have to help them make the judgments as to which rating agencies are appropriate for which programs. Great, thank you so much. Again, during your time as chairman, you've championed uh, issues that protect investors while giving them greater access to choice. Uh, my colleague from Minnesota and I, Dean Phillips, have a bill that we've introduced that would direct the SEC to do more tailoring on your rules for registered index-linked annuities. Uh, those products give uh, investors access to upside while giving them capital protection, but a lot of the forms they have to fill out are built for equity companies that, that have a lot of information that is not necessarily relevant and just hard for them to navigate. So uh, again, this is something that we don't have to pass a bill on. You could actually fix this yourself. And I would just uh, highlight it for your attention and I hope you'll pay attention and fix that yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wanna again thank you for your uh, great work at the Securities and Exchange Commission. You've got unfinished business. We know you're focused on that and gonna stay focused on that through the end of the year. Good luck in, in whatever the future holds for you, but uh, thank you for what you're doing for investors every day, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. There seems to be bipartisan support for that position. We'll now recognize uh, Mr. Foster. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Chair Clayton, for, for being here. I, I really appreciate the work that you and your staff have done in being proactive about looking out for uh, scams and fraud related to COVID. It's, it's important, it's timely. Um, equally important, and maybe more important in terms of market capitalization, are the possibilities of share price manipulation among pharmaceutical firms, as all of these ongoing uh, uh, clinical trials report out. You've already seen situations where results have been released, massive uh, swings in share prices, um, and scientists questioning the timing uh, from a scientific point of view of the release of that information. Are you doing anything in that, in that way to look at uh, look at possible let, share price manipulation. Let, let, me, let me try and do this in the most uh, appropriate way. We don't, we don't talk about pending investigations. We just don't do it. Um, do, do we look for um, patterns of activity generally um, that would create suspicion in anybody's mind? Uh, timing of announcements, uh, timing of buys, timing of sales, that type of, yes, we have a group that does that. We use, um, uh, have you added extra capacity and, and moved your eyes directly towards the yeah, so COVID-related pharmaceuticals? I'm sorry, I'm being more elliptical than I should be. And then we do that in the context of the current day. And we are doing it in the context of the current day. Just as we're looking at COVID-related fraud, we're looking at, at anything um, that would be market moving um, in the context of what the kind of pharmaceuticals, other things that you're talking about. 
In, right now, let me, let me be clear about this. Right now, we've, we've encouraged companies to get out there with information um, as quickly and transparently as possible, because on uncertain times, non-public information becomes incredibly valuable, and it is a place where there can be um, great misconduct. We, we want companies to be as transparent as possible, and, what, and when they're not disclosing information, to keep it as confidential as possible. Yeah, well, that obviously makes them a huge target for things like cyber espionage and so on. Yes. Which, uh, and so that's, I just urge you to really keep your eyes focused on that sector because there are going to be very important clinical trials reporting out over the next months, and the eyes of the world are going to be on these, and lots of investors are going to be uh, involved. Now, you know, I appreciate uh, all of the efforts you've had to, you've made to continually uh, be effective in your job as the SEC as you were being considered for, to lead the Southern District New New York office. And I, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate that your discussions that you must have had with uh, Attorney General Barr, the President, and so on, anyone in that command chain really should be uh, remain confidential. But separate from that, did you have any discussions with uh, anyone representing or speaking for the Trump organ family organization, the Trump, President Trump's private lawyers, or anyone outside the command chain uh, that goes through Attorney General Barr? Um, uh, look, I, I don't want to go down the road of getting, in, uh, getting into all of these things, but um, the, I, I've not talked to anybody about any pending matters um, uh, you no, know. no, I was talking about the considerations involving your appointment. Yeah, were, they con were they confined to the appropriate command line that goes through Attorney General Barr, from the President, Attorney General Barr, and that command line? Or was there, did you have communications outside of that, of the command chain, which I think, yeah. you know, shouldn't be subject to the same sort of confidentiality? Yeah, let me say it this way. I don't want to get into what, I'm not going to talk about it, there's a time, but I am completely comfortable that anybody I talked to about this was appropriate to talk to. Were you contacted by people that you that you turned away because you did not feel comfortable? I, I'm just going to leave it at that. I, I, I have, okay. I, I, I'm, oh, let's say it's something. All right, a consolidated audit trail. Uh, you know, this is uh, one of the. Um, you know, that was on your to-do list when you came into the job. Um, how how do you feel like the progress you've made, particularly in relating to what will I think ultimately be the toughest thing, which is getting international agreement. Uh, to have uh, you know personal identifiers for the participants uh, for trades in international venues. How do you see that going? So I, I think we've made substantial progress. Let me let me say that um, we started from a bad spot. Uh, we started from a bad spot um, in terms of security um, and in terms of architecture, and we have we have made substantial progress. I b I believe we will have a completed consolidated audit trail that functions as intended. Um, it'll be late. Um, it's already late, but I, I think we're going to get there. But that will require international agreements uh, to get access to the actual identities of the participants at foreign venues. And, and this has always struck me the toughest thing. It's probably not made easier uh, because of an administration that isn't enthusiastic about international agreements. Mm -hmm. And I, what, what sort of progress do you see has been made there? We are making progress internationally on, um, on that type of L-E-I or the like. Okay, thank you, and I'll, I'll be following up. Yeah, no, please. You. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to have uh, Chairman Clayton with us today, and I want to thank you, Chairman Clayton, for the Commission's leadership and your staff's leadership through the pandemic crisis of March, where you kept your head about you as your fellow commissioners did when all were losing theirs around you. I think there's a poem in there somewhere. Uh, but specifically in keeping our markets open for the benefit of our constituents, that they had access to knowing the value of their account and could consult with their investment professionals through that period. And again, as I always do, I commend the work of the Fed and the, and the Treasury for their quick work in liquidity. So. Thank you for being a part of a team that got uh, our capital markets function again for the benefit of companies who employ millions and millions uh, of uh, Americans. And also, uh, thank you for your support as chair for entrepreneurship and capital formation, and you're putting, in a, putting strong attention on that, as well as the need to assess things uh, that are important to the fintech uh, arena. 
We have a new Securities Commissioner in Arkansas as of uh, last month, Eric Munson, and we look forward to you to meeting Eric in his new capacity and look forward to hopefully introducing you personally uh, to uh, Eric as he takes up his new responsibilities at the Arkansas Securities Department. I want to take a minute today and uh, talk about uh, one of Mr. Sherman's bills uh, that is not introduced yet, I don't think, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a bill that you, are, you mentioned on our call the other day on potentially having uh, the primary corporate facility of the Fed be sure that it's subject to Section 4003 of the CARES Act. And I took that comment from you, and it's in our commission report dated June uh, 18th that the Fed and the Treasury confirmed that any bond uh, purchased in the primary corporate facility is in compliance with the uh, limitations in the CARES Act. So. Uh, that uh, is in uh, of it, no if, the, if the gentleman will yield, I have little doubt that everything that's being done is legal. I, uh, I can't yield to you right now because I'm busy uh, talking to our, our good SEC chair, but I'll be back in touch uh, later. Uh, but thank you, and if I can help on that. Mr. Clayton, I want to talk to you about the municipal uh, order that you issued uh, providing exemptive relief to municipal advisors <laughs> under the uh, rubric that it's good during the pandemic. Uh, you know my views on this. I've expressed them to you in a, in a long uh, letter dated February during the comment period on it. I don't really uh, believe that this should have been done by exemptive relief. I've expressed that to you. I think if we're going to make changes in the municipal market for our state and local governments, we ought to do that through the APA with the rulemaking. Uh, what led uh, the Commission to do a temporary order rather than following the Administrative Procedures Act? <laughs> well, let, let me say this. Um, whether, wh whether we have to follow the APA or not, I think we're, we're confident that um, the way we've done this is appropriate. In, it, but it, it's very narrow. Um, this was something that was contemplated, and it's temporary. And it would be my expectation that if this were done on anything at like a permanent basis, um, or in any broader scope, uh, that there would be opportunity for notice and comment. Thank you. Well, I do recognize that you made significant narrowing uh, of the scope uh, since it was originally proposed, <clears throat> and you attempted to meet some of the questions that came in in the comments uh, from the bond dealers and from the MSRB itself. But I, I see your uh, temporary relief was dated June 16th, and when you look at the, the municipal securities market, I mean, it's it's functioning quite well due to the work of the Fed and the Treasury. Uh, I see no lack of access for state and local governments to reach the market through traditional means. In fact, all of the month of June has seen capital inflows into all the tax-exempt bond funds. So mm -hmm. um, I don't view it as, a, as an emergency situation. I view this more as a wolf in COVID sheep clothing uh, in terms of using the pandemic to justify its um, its rationale. So uh, if the uh, end of the temporary order, a municipal advisor must notify the SEC of any direct placements. Will the SEC make that public, that information, who, who, who does those uh, placements? Uh, we, we've, we're going to get that information. Um, I don't want to commit here to making it public, but I will commit to um, considering whether it should be made public. Um, and look, I, I would expect that the activity during this period would be something that would be considered, again, through any kind of uh, open notice and rulemaking, um, if this were going to be extended, expanded, uh, or the like. I, I do want to note that it's limited in size, and the secondary market distribution is extremely limited. Right. Thank you. I appreciate, again, our dialogue on this. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. The next uh, question I'll recognize is, uh, heads and shoulders above the average member of Congress uh, all the time, but today he's uh, 15 feet uh, above us here in the hearing room on the screen, and that is Mr. Meeks. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for uh, holding this crucial hearing today. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, most people actually wish this hearing was uh, a little less important. The only issues at stake here were our securities laws and our capital market regulations. 
and the investor protection bill before this committee. Undoubtedly, these things are crucial to our strength as a nation and our status as financial capital of the world. But I would be remiss if I did not uh, say all of these issues are built uh, uh, on something vital uh, and even more important, and that is the rule of law. You know, recently millions of Americans have taken to the streets shouting, no justice, no peace. And their core notion here is simple, that no person is above the law, regardless of whether they are wealthy, whether they wear a blue uniform and a badge, or even if they live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And they want to make sure there's equity and that the justice system is, uh, is fair to everyone. And I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, by the standards of the administration, you clearly have had a solid run at the SEC, and your tenure has not been littered uh, with uh, corruption or scandals or anything of that nature. Uh, in fact, I am really, uh, you uh, really worked hard on issues like uh, cryptocurrency scams, and you've taken real steps to protect investors, in my view. So I certainly hope that uh, things uh, don't go awry. Uh, in regards to what uh, you are now being considered for uh, and, uh, and that we continue to try to make sure that we have liberty and justice for all and it does not uh, ruin your reputation as you move forward. I'll stop there and let's go to some policy questions uh, that I think are important for us, for me to ask you, uh, listening to some of your statements earlier in regards to you're going to be focused uh, continually on your job as the chairman of the SEC. So my, my first question is the SEC whistleblower program that was created by Dodd-Frank. It has been incredibly successful at uncovering fraud on the, in our financial markets. And your predecessor, Mary Jo White, called the program a game changer and stated it has, uh, it is uh, past time to stop wringing our hands about whistleblowers. They provide an invaluable public service and they should be supported. So my question is to you, sir, so why have you sought to reform a program that uh, seemed to be so improving to be so uh, effective? Um, I, I believe, uh, let me make sure I have it correctly, you're, you're talking about um, our whistleblower um, uh, pending amendments, um, and let me say this about our whistleblower program. It has been extremely successful, and I am extremely supportive of it. Um, I think you can see from the recent awards um, that uh, uh, we have not slowed down. In fact, we've sped up uh, the timing uh, for uh, processing awards and getting them out to whistleblowers. What I'm committed to doing is making this program as transparent and as efficient as possible. And I'm hoping to move forward to finalize those amendments. Um, and what I will say is not decreasing but actually increasing the incentives for people to come forward as promptly as practicable. Well, thank you for that. We'll be watching and following him because that is uh, tremendous. You know, we've seen whistleblowers uh, recently, uh, their uh, reputations ruined and tried to seem to me uh, to discourage folks, not necessarily from the SEC, but with some other policies uh, that has uh, taken place, uh, particularly coming out of 1600. Uh, let, let me ask this other question in my last time. In the last few months, a record number of day traders have become active in the markets. And, you know, Jim Cramer uh, recently claimed that Warren Buffett is overrated and washed up, that was his language, and used a scrabble bag to recommend stocks to his millions of followers. So my question is, how has the SEC reacted to this phenomenon of day traders? And does it need any additional tools from Congress to address this issue? Um. I don't know that we need additional tools, but I, I do see, and, and there's no doubt about this, there has been increased short-term retail participation in our markets. And when I see that, it concerns me. I want, uh, it concerns me that people do not know the risks they're taking, particularly in leveraged products, options, and trading on margin. And let me just take this opportunity to thank you for the question and to tell all of our retail investors, you know, these are sophisticated products that have um, risks that may not be apparent, and um, you, should be, you should be quite cautious in trading with leverage, trading in options, trading, let me leave it, I'm sorry, my time's out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davidson from Ohio. 
I thank the chairman. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And Chairman Clayton, after your appearance before the full committee uh, last time, I submitted questions for the record regarding bulk download of data from FINRA's consolidated audit trail system. Uh, thank you for your response to the questions. And in your response, you highlighted that the work uh, the SEC has taken uh, to limit types of data collected as well as the directive for the SEC staff to provide recommendations that will help enhance uh, the consolidated audit trail cyber and data security. So thank you for that. Um, it, as you know, uh, this is the, uh, as proposed, would be the largest database to be created and overseen by a regulatory agency, and it contains extremely sensitive information. Uh, every firm that's supplying this data would view it as uh, very proprietary, trade secrets, uh, the keys to the kingdom. The concern is all the more highlighted by the SEC itself suffering a breach of the Edgar system in 2016. One of the questions you posed to staff in your directive was the issue of bulk data downloads. And as I understand it, uh, the more than 20 SROs and the SEC would be able to download bulk data from CAT. Uh, what particular concerns do you have in mind with this data being distributed across SROs that led you to pose these questions to the SEC staff, and what do you think should be done to ensure the SEC and FINRA have proper internal risk controls to ensure both data held uh, in the CAT and as, as well as held by them once it's downloaded, uh, and are you evaluating those controls? Uh, so so the, the short answer is yes, we're evaluating those controls. It's the types of risk that um, you identified that caused me to ask these questions. And if you'll allow me to speak generally um, and, and know that this is a complicated problem, I'm looking at it this way. We have you know, X number of SROs, a lot. We shouldn't start with the idea that everybody gets the data and then maybe we peel back a little bit. We should start with the idea that the SEC gets all the data because we need it um, and then see what others need to do their jobs. But starting with everybody gets all the data and then start kind of peeling back, I don't think is the right perspective. I think starting with the idea that we at the SEC with our cross-market um, obligations have access to all the data, but others get data as they need to do their jobs. I don't, want to, I don't want to keep them from being able to do their jobs, but let's scope the data consistent with the obligations they have. Yeah, when you say all the data, I want to be sure that you're clarifying all the data that is actually collected because you've, you've highlighted the importance of uh, first and foremost, not collecting data that you don't need and, frankly, data that could. Uh, and I think the other thing that you've highlighted that's a good measure is segregating the data that would be, you know, personally identifiable to firm or individuals. Right. So uh, I think good controls. And while I understand that perhaps not all of the SEC staff recommendations may be made public, would you be willing to share with, uh, with, with our office or with members of this body how we could collaborate in this effort? Um. I think we're doing a good job collaborating uh, um, already, and that, that, what I'll say, philosophy that I just described of, you know, what, what data do you need to do your job, not, not here's the data, figure out how to do your job, is the right way to approach this. Okay, well, I, I hope we can uh, collaborate a little more closely, frankly, but uh, I want to mention uh, cryptocurrencies uh, or digital assets as they're more correctly known, because most of them don't aspire to be actual currencies, or many of them don't even... Uh, want to handle payment systems. So uh, I would just encourage you and the staff to continue to look at a truly uh, nonpartisan bill, the Token Taxonomy Act, because it provides a bright line test applicable to digital assets. Uh, you know, and, it, and it's not a change of the Howey test, it's an application to this field. And I'd say lastly, uh, you know, I joined uh, uh, more than 100 colleagues to express our concerns in the commercial mortgage-backed securities market. Uh, you know, a lot of us are very concerned that uh, the commercial space is going to be, it was immediately disrupted because it's so highly liquid and very sensitive to, uh, you know, no buy side for anything, uh, frankly, to the point where the Fed had to intervene even for municipal bonds. So when you had this uh, margin call death spiral that was going on for all sorts of things in March, uh, the Fed provided essential stability for most things but not much on CMBS, uh, and, and you know, many firms have already gone bankrupt in that space. Uh, this wasn't bankruptcy because of lack of collateral, it was a bankruptcy due to complete lack of liquidity. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're looking at a similar challenge where uh, 
people aren't facing challenges because they lack sufficient collateral, they're lacking uh, a market structure that can deal with, uh, with it. Are you working on this? We are. Look forward to it. My time's expired, unfortunately. You. Mr. Vargas. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Appreciate it very much. And Chairman Clayton, thank you for being here. I do apologize. I stepped out for a little while to vote, so I didn't hear all your testimony, but I've been here since the beginning. But I did want to ask you, have you ever been a prosecutor? Have you ever been a prosecutor? Look, I, I have, I've, I've never been a prosecutor, but I'm not, I don't want to... I, it's just a simple this. question. I'm just asking you, have you ever been a prosecutor? Well, at the SEC, I Anywhere. oversee, I, I, I oversee 1,300 enforcement attorneys. They've brought 2,000 cases in the time I've been there. We've uh, collected over $10 billion in fines and disgorgement, returned $3 billion to uh, uh, harmed investors. Uh, many of the people who work under my oversight at the SEC are former prosecutors. So um, I, hope, I hope that gives you comfort in your question. Well, I, I have to say, I haven't known you for the decades that some of my colleagues have and who have certainly said sterling things about you today, but I do know your reputation for integrity. Uh, that's all I've heard about you in the past, that you, and we may not agree on everything, and there's some corporate governance issues that I want to ask you about, but my understanding is that you have a reputation for great integrity. That's my understanding. Thank I you. would just refer you to some of the generals that came in with great reputations for integrity and effectiveness, and what they were called by this administration on the way out or since they had left certainly has left their reputation in tatters. I would just refer you to them. I do want to ask you, however, about the ESG disclosures. Last month, the Investors Advisory Committee recommended that the Commission promulgate environmental, social, and governance disclosure standards and incorporate the disclosures into the broader disclosures regime of the SEC registered issuers. Similarly, the Asset Management and Advisory Committee echoed the IAC's calls for ESG, ESG disclosure standardization. As you may or may not know, in September 2019, this committee passed my bill, H.R. 4329, the ESG Disclosure Simplification Act of 2019. This bill, among others, requires public companies to disclose certain ESG metrics and directs the SEC to establish a rule delineating which metrics can be disclosed, must be disclosed. What are the Commission's next steps on ESG disclosures, and how does the Commission plan to bring bring clarity to ESG disclosures and improve the current market-based ESG reporting frameworks. The reason I ask this, because I think that this terrible COVID-19 might be a terrible precursor for climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have been very um, transparent about my views on, on ESG disclosure. In fact, I, on Tuesday, I believe it was, I appeared for an hour to discuss this topic and how to get, how to get more meaningful disclosure to investors. Let me, let me be clear. I believe that there are e-topics for a number of companies that are extremely important from a disclosure um, perspective. I believe that there are S-topics and, and there are G-topics. Let's put G to the side because we have a tremendous amount of G disclosure. Uh, if you talk to investors, it's, it's very clear that they, they can understand how a company is governed from the disclosure we have and, and compensation and the like. Um, in, in terms, if you don't mind if I go to e-disclosure, mm -hmm. we are working both domestically and internationally, on trying to get um, what I will say is um, more robust data, but on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, because it's very different from sector to sector what e, what e information is important to investors. So for property and casualty, you got a property and casualty portfolio that's along the coast, the modeling of potential losses and the like from different climate scenarios, that's important to mm -hmm. investors. But if you look at, you know, uh, a manufacturing facility, um, a company based in, so, you know, let's just say the Midwest. That depends on where it is, though, of course. Of course. It's, yeah. it's, it's a completely different um, scenario. And in some cases, companies can adjust. In other cases, they're price takers in this space. I, I do believe, through my work with IOSCO, and, and in particular my friends uh, Eric Thedin in Sweden, we've been working collaboratively on, on, on a taxonomy. We're, we're getting there where we're not just going to use blunt metrics, we're, but we're going to have, have principle-based and good disclosure. Uh, my time's almost uh, ended, but I, I was going to ask you about corporate governance, but I do want to ask you about diversity about the last few minutes here. Obviously, there needs to be more diversity, I believe, uh, 
both in um, financial service industry at the highest level, but also at the SEC. Could you just comment on that, the few seconds we have left? Look, this has been a, this has been a, a focus of mine since arriving at the SEC. We've made progress. We need to make more progress. Um, we, have, we have brought diversity and inclusion and opportunity, not, not just as something that is in an office or in, is in a training program, but I believe we're bringing it into the fabric of the SEC. We're integrating our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion into our hiring processes and our processes for identifying people on committees. Um, our Asset Management Advisory Committee is holding a, a special roundtable uh, next month. Mike, so this is thank, something that I'm committed to. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hollingsworth. Right over here. Oh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to talk about a few things. I probably won't take my full time. First and foremost, I wanted to uh, commend Mr. Vargas on his work with regard to ESG. This is important work, and I appreciate what you've done also in developing a taxonomy, a language that is clear, that helps investors, and doesn't muddy the waters with regard to what disclosures should be necessary for a company. So I appreciate that and appreciate Mr. Vargas' leadership on that. In addition to that, I wanted to thank you for some of the recent work you've done on extending the exemption from 404B. This was a bill that I and Cinema uh, last Congress introduced that had strong bipartisan support. McAdams across the aisle and I have introduced it last year. And I know you've done great work on this already and I really appreciate that. And for the many, many companies that will benefit from that and can pour more of their dollars into research and development instead of unnecessary and burdensome compliance, they appreciate it as well back home. So thank you for that. Secondarily, I had recently written you a letter a couple of months ago. Admittedly, you've had a lot going on about how we could reduce some of the barriers to liquidity for angel and early stage investors by modernizing the definition of venture capital fund. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I followed up with you on that just to say this continues to be important and continues to be ever more important given some of the dynamics that are going on in our early stage companies and would appreciate should time allow getting a response on that so that we can move that ball forward. This is something that I'm working with bicamerally and bipartisan to find a solution for. So if we could get back on that, that would be great. In addition to that, I wanted to cover two abstract topics. The Everyone in March saw the markets go down. Everyone immediately assumed that something must be wrong. Can you clarify really briefly that markets going down, even significantly in a single day, significantly in a single month, is not dispositive, conclusive, that something is wrong or not functioning in the markets? Uh, what I, what I can say mm -hmm. is we've been monitoring the markets throughout. I mean, this is, this is the greatest period of uncertainty in terms of economic performance, you know, I, I have seen in the, in the, in the real economy. You know, we had a financial crisis. Dur during that period, I, I am, and look, I don't want, I don't want to count, you know, I don't get to do any victory laps or anything like that, but the markets performed incredibly well. Right. Now, it required action by the Fed, by the Treasury, by us, by private sector participants. But the fact that credit and capital continued to flow throughout the system um, was, was exactly what you would want. Exactly. And just to crystallize that very point, as you well articulated, it's important for us to remember that circumstances also change. And there were reasons to believe that companies might be valued less than they were in February on account of what their discounted cash flows might be in the future. That is signs of markets working, not necessarily markets not working. Secondarily, I wanted to also bring up materiality, um, because I know that there are several bills that are being considered uh, in this committee right now that I believe may be redundant, right? that companies need to disclose if there might be a material impact to their supply chain, disclose if there might be a material impact to their workforce. As I understand it, and again, I am no SEC lawyer, but those things that are material, that management believes are material to their business and may have a material positive or negative impact on their business need to be disclosed already. Is that true or untrue? That, 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 is, a, that is a generally uh, correct statement about disclosure, and um, we have put out guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to act quickly and say, look, you have a, we have a principle-based disclosure system. Here are the things that you should consider when making your disclosure. What's your liquidity position? How is your operations affected? What's the health and safety of your workers? Right. Access to these things. And look, it, I don't want to grade people, <laughs> but, uh, but overall, the disclosure in first quarter earnings through mm -hmm. that cycle was extremely strong. Right. I think it, I think it gave 
investors' confidence that companies were telling them exactly where they stood. As we go into second quarter earnings, I, let, me, let me take this opportunity to say I expect companies to be as forthcoming um, and as um, uh, comprehensive as possible, and, and doing so from the lens of how management and the board of directors are looking at the business and its prospects. Right. If, you know, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have bad news than no news. Oh, great. You know, let's, Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, you being here. We'll, I yield we'll, back. We'll, will the gentleman yield? Gentlemen, will yield. Well, thank you. I, I, I wish my uh, friend, and he is a genuine friend from California, was still here. I, uh, he's here. He, oh, he's here. So he's here. good, he can hear it. So I, I, I wanted to ask a rhetorical question. He was asking you early on about whether you had ever been a prosecutor. I think some of us maybe uh, want to ask uh, how many members of this committee have been bankers or insurance agents or Section 8 housing providers. Precious few, I might, uh, I might note. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is the type of place where a licensed realtor or a the CPA time of the gentleman has become expired. chair of this committee and serve the, the, the time. Your point has been made. The time of the gentleman has expired. <laughs> uh, and now, also participating by WebEx, uh, Mr. San Nicholas. Thank you, Chairman Sherman. Good day to you, Chairman Clayton. And uh, just to add, answer to our prior colleague's question, uh, I do have uh, prior banking and investment advisor experience. Um, so there are those of us uh, within the committee who do provide it, and we're more than happy to um, engage with our fellow colleagues in order to provide perspective uh, to include theirs, because when it comes to financial services, it's important for us to have the mind that it, it uh, impacts the entire country, not just those who have this, the specialty or the expertise. Uh, that being said, um, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to uh, um, first recognize my colleague, uh, Chairman uh, Meeks, who opened the door to what I wanted to talk about, uh, which is um, the concern about uh, potential overexposure of retail investors uh, under current market circumstances. Um, we've seen a lot of new market participants engage in active trading activities to include day trading and swing trading. Um, but of, of late, there's also been a, a, a much larger increase in um, the access of retail investors uh, to, as you mentioned, uh, Chairman Clayton, um, some exotic instruments, uh, derivatives, uh, options, and naked calls, uh, being able to purchase these kinds of assets uh, these kind of trading vehicles, um, these kind of hedge instruments, um, even on margin. And so um, I wanted to, uh, um, you, you were speaking about it earlier before time expired. Um, before I go into my question, I wanted to go ahead and afford you a, a few moments to uh, go ahead and uh, uh, make your statement on, on the risks that you're seeing with respect to uh, retail investor overexposure. Um, well, uh, look, I, what, thank you for the opportunity because I, what I want to say to our retail investors is, when, you, when we have times of volatility, um, you hear stories of people making a great deal of money um, as a result of buying low and selling high, and, and perhaps even doing so on a leveraged basis or through options. And you know what? The, our kind of investor is the long-term retail investor. There are significant risks in taking those short-term leveraged margin positions. Um, unless you understand those risks and are able to bear those risks, you should not be doing it. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. And on to my question. While individual investors and traders, of course, have their own responsibilities in, in um, the decisions they make and the capital they put at risk and then the leverage they expose themselves to, um, the platforms that make those um, uh, trades available to the um, investors and traders, they also have a responsibility. They have a responsibility to ensure the suitability of the individual making those trades. And so I wanted to um, um, ask whether or not the SEC, given the increase in retail investor activity, has, has the SEC in, enhanced its review of trading platform um, due diligence in ensuring that the uh, investor uh, has a suitability test, a proper suitability test for um, access to day trading, derivatives trading, and margin, ac uh, margin access? Um. We, we are looking at this issue. Let me try and, let me try and break it down. There, there are self-directed accounts where you're not dealing with um, someone who has uh, our new Reg BI obligation, which goes in at the end of the month, and which I believe will, and I'm, I'm making this clear to brokers right now, should, um, through the CARE obligation, um, 
make sure that investors do understand those risks and are able to bear those risks as appropriate. We are looking at the self-directed aspects of our market ecosystem and whether um, the, uh, let me put it this way, the access to those is being um, granted as appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I guess to close, uh, I, I really think it's important for the SEC to really uh, uh, circle back on this and make sure that um, uh, even the self-directed accounts um, have um, the proper um, disclosures, but more importantly, that it, it's it's being done in a way where the uh, the investor fully understands the risks that they're that they're getting themselves involved with, because um, not only are we talking about potential overexposure of an individual investor, but there, there's going to come a time if we're not careful that um, we're going to be um, having counterparty risk and we're going to be having um, those kind of situations where a whole group of individual investors potentially making a lot of leverage derivative bad decisions are going to um, begin impacting the ability for the markets to function orderly. And while we may you know, look at that and, and think that it might not necessarily present itself, that's exactly the same kind of mentality that we had prior to um, the uh, subprime crisis when we thought that tranching everything and spreading out the risk was, was good enough. And so, Mr. Chairman, I just ask that you keep a, a very close eye on this in order to not only protect our retail investors, but to ensure our orderly markets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The uh, witness should know that we have about eight to 10 additional speakers, uh, so you'll be out of here in less than an hour. We do not intend to have a uh, second round, and I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, for holding this hearing today. And, and of course, I want to thank you, Chairman Clayton, uh, for being with us today and all your work at the SEC. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge and thank your team for working with the other regulars on reforms to the Volcker Rule. Uh, I led a letter this past December encouraging regulators to amend the rule to exempt qualifying venture funds from the definition of covered fund uh, in order to help spur investments in states like mine, Ohio, uh, that are in, in additional need for, for startup capital. So I thank you for that. Uh, additionally, uh, I want to thank you for your recent response to a letter that I wrote with my friend, uh, Ms. Wagner, in support of additional access for retail investors to private markets. You and I have spoken about this privately. Uh, yeah, was it clear? It's clear. I mean, <clears throat> you know. Always fun with the technology. Um, but uh, as you're aware, the, the number of publicly listed companies wow. has, uh, yeah. has gone down significantly, um, while some of our fastest growing, Uber, Lyft, Slack, et cetera, uh, accumulate a significant amount of the growth in, in uh, the private markets before going public. Always been my belief that, that we must do more to safely provide everyday Americans access uh, to those opportunities uh, to the extent we can. Um, my first question on that front, in, in your response to my letter, you stated that closed-end funds could present an avenue for expanding investment options for Main Street investors. Uh, can you discuss more why you think this um, and also provide a good up, and, and, and also what are the current roadblocks? Um, sure. Uh, look, I, I want our, my objective is for our retail investors to have access to investment opportunities that are aligned with professionals. One of the great things about our, our public capital markets is retail sits right beside institutional and they get the benefit of that professional alignment of interest. When you, when you move into the private markets, you want to make sure that you maintain that alignment of interest. Yeah. And I believe that closed end funds are one option for being able to do that. Um, but it ha you have to have that alignment of interest and you have to have um, what I would say is low cost, reasonable cost of access. Otherwise, you know, uh, but I think we, we're, we're exploring ways to do that and um, um, we're making progress. Thank you and I'm excited about the progress uh, that you have made on that. Um, as a follow-up, uh, what, what are you currently doing to promote closed-end funds as a way to access private markets? Is there any consideration of rescinding the staff guidance that prohibits closed-end funds from investing more than 15% of their assets in private funds unless the sale is limited to accredited investors? So I, that specific question, let me just say this, as part of our overall looking yeah. at it, we are, but it gets to, it gets to liquidity, and we gotta make sure that we have the appropriate amount of liquidity, uh, including in, in closed-end funds. Great. Um, shifting to China for a second, um, first, I, I want to uh, reiterate support uh, for Mr. Sherman and Senator Kennedy's legislation, uh, which I have joined uh, to what I would call uh, have China play by the same rules as, as the rest of 
uh, the companies in our stock exchanges. Um, building off the need to, to further protect US, invest, US investors from China, just yesterday, the Financial Times published an article that linked to a recent Pentagon listing of 20 Chinese companies that have ties to the Chinese military. Uh, this includes two companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, going forward, how do we make sure that investors have this information, especially since these companies are at greater risk of being targeted by United States sanctions, potentially? Um, look, we, we have a disclosure-based regime, and it, and it works. It has, it has worked really well um, because if you don't, if, let's put it this way, if you don't disclose appropriately, if you make material misstatements or omissions or commit fraud, we can come after you. Um, one, of, one of the things that retail investors, institutional investors know this, retail investors should understand is our ability to enforce that perspective is not uniform across the world. Right. And we need to take that into account. Investment advisors need to take that into account. Investment professionals need to take that into account. And you know, these are the kind of challenges you face in a job like this. How much can disclosure do in circumstances like that? So quickly, do you believe that that information, being on a list of 20 companies, uh, is material for US investors? You know, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to make a blanket statement, but if, if you're considering um, you know, what is material about your company or not material about your company, the fact that you may be subject to significant sanctions is something that you would, you would want to ask that question and see if the company, company's operations and the like, or its reputation or whatever. Um, right. I, would argue, I would argue it is. And with my last uh, question, do you believe that China's, yeah, I'll submit it in writing. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. You. Uh, Ms. Porter. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Clayton, for being here with us today and for your patience as we navigate um, this hearing. You've um, recently been uh, named as the likely replacement for Southern District of U.S. Um, Attorney uh, Berman. The U.S. Attorney's Office, as you know, has been apolitical for over 200 years. Do you agree that it's important for the investigations undertaken by the U.S. Attorney's Office to be conducted in a nonpartisan manner? So, look, I. I'm here as the chairman of the SEC, but what I want to say about my work as chairman of the SEC and our work in the enforcement division, which is akin to any U.S. attorney's office, we undertake our work in an independent and nonpartisan manner. Terrific. Um, at the ch as the chairman of the SEC, you spearheaded numerous um, rule changes, one example being the so-called uh, regulation best interest, uh, Reg BI. Was that a nonpartisan proposal, yes or no? Um, from, from my perspective, what we've done with, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by nonpartisan. Okay, let me try this. Did the Reg BI rule change pass the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, with bipartisan support? Um, no, no. We, the, the, I think you're struggling toward no. No, I'm not struggling. I'm just making sure. Okay. Um, the, the vote on the Commissioner Jackson and... Well, it, it was multiple. It, no, it did not have. It did not have complete. Support. Reg BI did not have. Bi did Reg? Let's try this one more time. Did Reg BI have? Bi did it pass the commission with bipartisan support? No, it did not. No, it did not. Thank you. What about your shareholder voting proposal? Did that get bipartisan support? Uh, as a proposal going out, no, it did not. Okay. What about your proxy advisor limits proposal? Uh, no, that did not. What about your proposal to expand private markets? Pardon me. Your proposal to expand private markets. Um, which, are you talking about, uh, I, we don't have a, a, you mean harmonization? The proposal for harmonization? I don't remember. It, I, I'll assume you're right. It did not have okay. bipartisan. So, Mr. Clayton, calling yourself nonpartisan doesn't make it true. And your leadership at the SEC is to be generous, inconsistent with being nonpartisan. I think becoming a U.S. attorney would require a big change in your approach from the SEC. Hmm. Um, do you agree that independence from the president is necessary to agency independence? Um, so, wait a second. I just want to go back to the bipartisan, nonpartisan. I, I believe if you look at my voting record across the SEC, which is a pretty good, there are many times when I have voted with Democratic commissioners, maybe both Democratic commissioners and not the Republican commissioners, um, and vice versa. I, I vote the way I think I should, without regard to 
um, partisanship. Right. That's what I do. Okay. That's what I would do in any job. Okay, great. Um, do you think that independence from the president is necessary to agency independence? I think, I think in, agency independence is independence from, look, I interact with you people, I interact with agencies, I interact with other, independence does not mean isolated, but independence means doing what you think is right based on your experience. Do you think independence from the president is possible if you and the president are golfing buddies? Um, I absolutely do, because I do it, I, I do my job every day without fear or favor. And we do justice at the SEC, and I think if you look at the record of the SEC, it's absolutely clear. How many times have you and President Trump golfed together? I'm, I'm not gonna get into to this. This is, you know, it, it, it's... It, is it a large number and you have trouble recalling it? No, no, no. Look, I, I, have, I have played golf with the president a handful of times. Okay. Um, what did you talk about? Those are private conversations. Uh, are you willing to affirm to this committee that you did not discuss any SEC business? There, there, is, there are no conversations that I've had that make me in any way, in any way, uncomfortable with my independence. Wonderful. Before you golf, I'm glad to hear that. Before you golf with the president, did you ask the SEC Ethics Council to advise you on that decision? Um, yes. Y you did? Yes. And did they issue an, a, a written opinion? No, but, I, but the answer is yes, I did. You, you did. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I want to turn to talking about um, your prior work at your law firm. Um, in your time at Sullivan and Cromwell, um, did you ever um, serve as uh, investi uh, on the plaintiff side of any securities or um, other matters? Or were you solely defense counsel defending organizations like Deutsche Bank and Goldman Sachs? Um, uh, time. The, 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 let, me, let me say what... Uh, the, time the witness will be allowed to answer briefly, then we'll go on to the next witness. Mr. Uh, Chairman, the, the witness shouldn't be compelled to answer at all. The time has expired. And, and I'm sorry, welcome to your, uh, your there, confirmation hearing. There, uh, I've allowed other people to go a few Mr. seconds Mr. Chairman, over. you did not allow, you cut me off two seconds early, actually. Actually, Mr. that is absolutely correct. Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized, because it's actually my time? Not anymore. Uh, your, your time expired. I would like to offer to allow Mr. Clayton to respond in writing, if that would be acceptable to him. My question was, just to state it again, because there was knocking and interruptions while I was speaking, After was, the are oh, there... Mr. Chairman, excuse, excuse me. The, uh, the offer uh, to get an answer in writing is fully consistent with committee rules. All uh, uh, the the uh, hearing uh, record will be kept open, the uh, usual number of days for people to submit questions in writing. And that can be a question in writing. We expect a relatively prompt response to the written questions that are presented after the hearing. That is what we've done in every hearing. We will now go on to Mr. Uh, Mr. Stile. We look forward to reading your answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clayton, for being here. I'd like to remind all of my colleagues that this is not a confirmation hearing. We're not the Senate. This is in the House. If a confirmation hearing is required, that'd be the role of the Senate. And if somebody would like to participate in that, they are more than welcome to run for the United States Senate and participate in a confirmation hearing. I'd like to dive in as to the topic that we are here for today, which is about monetary policy, the state of the economy, and how we're keeping our capital markets strong during some of these most challenging times that we've seen here uh, in a long time. Uh, first off, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman Clayton, I want to start by thanking you for your work to improve oversight of proxy advisors. Uh, I also want to recognize Commissioner Roisman, who's been a valuable voice on this topic. As you know, I dealt with proxy advisors in my private sector career, and so I understand how important it is to get this issue right. In the last few months, uh, SEC commissioners made a couple public comments uh, that I believe have been viewed by some uh, as evidence that the SEC may be softening its approach as it relates to proxy advisor reform. Uh, among other things, Commissioner Roisman suggested that the final rule may include a speed bump uh, that limits the ability of investors to use so-called set it and forget it uh, mechanisms to automatically populate uh, electronic ballots uh, with proxy advisors' recommendations. It seems like that might be a little bit different than the peer uh, review process that was outlined previously. Uh, could you comment how the SEC intends to ensure uh, that issuers have the opportunity to correct 
erroneous or misleading recommendations uh, are that they're peer reviewed, the speed bump process, and whether or not one approach is more favorable than the other? So here, here's, you have outlined the issue we're trying to address, which is when you're making a voting decision, do you have the best information that's available to you to make that decision in a timely manner? And the process we have now can be improved. That's clear. And we're trying to approve it in the way that creates the least friction for people to be able to express their opinion. But the people who have to vote, you know, they should have a, ro a robust amount of information. Um, and, it, and to the extent practicable, it should be accurate. So we want to we want to make sure that the that the system produces that type of information. That's and we got a lot of helpful comments. You know, there are ideas. There's, there's a speed bump you'll mention, but that's where I'm driving: transparency and good information. I, I appreciate your work uh, and your colleagues' work on this important topic. Do you have a, an estimate as to when you believe a rule may be finalized on this? It, like I like I've done throughout my tenure, we put it on the agenda, and we try to get it done on the you know, on the time of the agenda. So our current agenda has it you know, completed by the end of the fiscal year. I continue to expect that we'll be able to complete it by the end of the fiscal year. I appreciate your work on the topic. Uh, Chairman Clayton, as you know, uh, emerging growth companies, um, the constructs have been, I think, a very valuable tool for helping startups uh, focus on innovation, job creation, uh, and growth. I think the EGCs are especially important today as we deal with the ongoing uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, since many investors are in particular in the biotechnology uh, industry. I'm concerned that many ECGs are facing uh, the loss of that status and may see significant increases uh, in their compliance burdens um, in the near term as a result. Uh, I think the timing is, is unfortunate given the economic uh, and managerial challenges associated with the pandemic, uh, as well as the role that the ECGs uh, could really play in this recovery. Um, and so I'm working on legislation to ensure EGCs uh, that face a loss of their status uh, can, receive, can receive a short-term reprieve. I'm not asking for you to comment specifically uh, on the legislation. I know, I know you wouldn't be doing that, but can you comment how the, econom the economic turmoil uh, that we've been experiencing uh, is impacting some of our emerging growth companies that need access to public markets? Um, look, let me, let, me, let me say this. Um, as a general matter, because of the actions of Congress, the Fed, and the Treasury, financing markets have been fairly open, both equity and debt. People have been able to term out their debt. They've been able to get liquidity. They've been able to you know, alter their balance sheets, add equity to their balance sheets. Always, as you go further down the size spectrum, similarly situated companies almost always have a, a, a bit of a hard time. Um, I think, by and large, EGCs have been able to get financing as well. But it is an area that we need to watch because, you know, it, it, let me put it this way, it, it, it's, it's much easier to allocate capital in a chunk to a large company than it is to allocate it in a chunk to a whole bunch of smaller companies. And that's just something we have to recognize. Understood. I, I appreciate your time today and respect to my time, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The chair uh, notes that uh, I actually care, I care about the health of my colleagues or at least uh, most of them and uh, therefore I urge all members to wear masks uh, at all times. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go uh, to uh, Ms. Axney uh, by WebEx. Uh, thank you, Chairman Sherman, and thank you for being here, uh, Chairman Clayton, appreciate it. One thing that I hear constantly from companies is that their greatest asset, of course, is their people, and uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, Chairman Clayton was hoping you could explain generally why you think understanding a company's workforce is crucial for investors to evaluate the company. Well, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a personal belief uh, through my uh, professional experience. Uh, th the best companies are the companies that understand their workforce, uh, however it um, uh, is structured uh, in in the in the best way. Um, more generally, and from a, from a financial point of view, uh, the, the contribution of uh, human capital and, and, and employees to companies has increased in proportion. If you, if you look 30 years ago, plant property and, and equipment was a lot of the assets on the balance sheet. Today, the, the assets of a company are intellectual property, people, and the like, by and large. And so, yes, it, it's extremely important. We have a pending rulemaking um, where 
we are going to encourage through our principles-based disclosure system companies to discuss their human capital as management views it. How do they evaluate it? How do they develop it? How do they increase the value of the company um, through their people? Th thank you so much. I completely agree with you on, on both a personal and a professional basis. Um, I've spent my career working in that arena as well. And that's why I worked with Senator Warner uh, to bring some light to this important uh, piece of information. I also think that the coronavirus has certainly highlighted some of those issues, especially when it comes to uh, workplace safety uh, and paid sick leave. Uh, and that's why myself, along with Senator Warner, sent you a letter, I believe that was last month, urging uh, some action to get more disclosure on this. Um, I didn't get a response to that letter. So since you're here, is that something that you would support? Um, uh, actually, uh, you, you will get a response. Um, but in the meantime, I believe yesterday we put out guidance uh, for second quarter earnings and things that people could, should think about in their um, earnings reports and their communications with their investors. And those types of issues were included in that guidance. Great, I'll, I'll absolutely take a look at that. I just, I just wanna let you know, I do have a little bit of concern. I know that uh, I appreciate your intent, but some of the concerns I've had around what all the principles-based approach, I believe, um, which didn't require specific metrics. And as somebody who's spent my career working in strategic and organizational development, I know that companies are obviously already measuring these uh, metrics and that turnover rate, for example, is something they all track and is very meaningful. If the SEC gives management discretion in these disclosures, are you worried that it will result, result in some unclear information um, and it won't give the numbers necessary for company to company comparison or comparisons for a company over previous years? So, so this is a really good discussion because uh, we're not saying don't disclose the metrics. What we're saying is disclose the metrics that you use. And you know, if a company uses turnover calculated in a certain way, they, they, presumably they do it because that's how they're managing their business and that's what the investor would, would wanna know. Um, what, I, what I don't wanna do is adopt a, a standard across a, a bunch of industries that's not how, that it, may, it may be right for one industry and in how management is using it, but it's not right for others. And that, so, so you, what I don't wanna do is to get comparability, give up meaningfulness. And that's the tension we always have in terms of establishing metrics that are broad. So we very much encourage companies to share the metrics that they use but you know, take the pharmaceutical industry and turnover, uh, very different from the tech sector, different from the transportation industry and how they may look at it. Well, I appreciate that. And I think there's an opportunity to work through some of those issues. I do think we're looking at a risk here though, and I'd advise you to uh, take a look at the letter uh, that I sent uh, with my Workforce Investment Disclosure Act, which lays out some very specific disclosures uh, that could be required. Workplace safety violations, for example, can tell you a heck of a lot about how many of these companies are going to get back online uh, more quickly uh, due to COVID. Uh, but moving on, we're running out of time. I wanted to just quickly turn to tax disclosures. As we all know, our large companies are only paying about 11, half of what the statutory rate is. I'm wondering if you could tell me uh, if you think there's some opportunity for us at SEC to be looking at country by country disclosures. Um, well, it, you, you actually you raise an excellent point um, that goes to both points on tax and on um, operational and safety issues. When you, when you have these kind of multinational companies trying to give investors a flavor for what happens across um, those various jurisdictions is very important, and we look at that. It's becoming an inc I recognize and, and, and want to be clear, it's becoming an increasing part of how sophisticated investors look at companies. I appreciate that. I know we're out of time. I yes, we are, at, we are out of time. At this time, we will go to uh, Mr. Gottheimer. If uh, you're up there, please turn. There he is. Got his camera on. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. Given the COVID-19 pandemic and the current racial justice issues facing our country, I think we can all agree it's more important than ever that all Americans have equal access and just access to credit. Every year, 15.4 million Americans are victims of credit card fraud, or around 42,000 people every day. 
The FTC has previously found that one in five consumers have verified errors in their credit reports, and one in 20 consumers have errors so serious that they'd be, not, they'd, they'd be denied credit or forced to pay higher interest rates, affecting everything from their from small business loans to a mortgage to a car loan. It adds up to 42 million Americans with errors in their credit and another 10 million with errors that can be life-altering. Next week, the House will consider my bipartisan legislation, the Protecting Your Credit Report Act, which will create a new online portal to provide Americans with free and unlimited access to their credit reports and scores, the ability to easily dispute errors and fraud, and the ability to secure and track their credit data, all to increase transparency and help Americans boost their credit and financial security through economic declines and beyond. Uh, Chairman Clayton, are you concerned, particularly during the pandemic, about credit issues and Americans' ability to have transparency into their credit? Uh, I, I am, so let me, let me start by saying that in, in general, credit access to credit, provision of credit is not within um, our authority, but I do talk about it a lot because I yes. always say to people, before you get involved in investing, understand your credit, get your credit under control. That's the best thing you can do for yourself. Now, uh, with respect to your question about access to credit and provision of consumer credit, we have a consumer-driven economy to a large extent. Um, I believe that the swift actions taken by Congress and by the Fed and the Treasury to enable credit to continue to flow have significantly dampened the negative effects of the COVID-19 response. Um, so yes, uh, consumer credit, having consumer credit that is appropriately priced and transparent is extremely important to our economy. To that point, do you think we should make it easier for people and Americans to get their credit information for free and initiate disputes, given, I know, as you've pointed out, how important people's credit information is? Look, I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane as to what um, particular uh, policy rationale, legislation, and the like. Uh, that's not our area. Uh, I don't want to tread on other people's area, but I, but I affirmatively uh, believe Having access to credit in a transparent way um, is important. Thank you. Uh, and our, uh, our legislation does just that. It puts a centralized portal. Uh, it's managed by the credit bureaus um, to give people more information and the ability to dispute that. Um, separately, AARP's Fraud Watch Network recently reported there's been a steep increase in scams targeting the elderly and other vulnerable communities this month. I know this is part of your jurisdiction directly. Uh, it's that issue has been driven largely by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. These nefarious actors, both domestic and international, are using the pandemic and preying on people's fragile states during these uncertain times to target their hard-earned retirement accounts, their unemployment checks, and other savings. Chairman Clayton, millions of seniors across the country have been the victims of financial scams, as you know, and been cheated out of their rightful retirements. I just wanted to know, um, and I, I've talked to you before about our Senior Security Act, but in general, do you agree that we should be doing everything possible to prevent our seniors from being robbed of their life savings? Uh, yes, I believe we should be doing everything possible to prevent our seniors from being subject to fraud, particularly financial fraud. Thank you, sir. The Senior Security Act, which we've talked about, is a bipartisan bill I introduced to my good friend, Mr. Hollingsworth, that would create a senior investor task force of the SEC, specifically designed to stop financial predators and hucksters from scamming seniors out of their savings. And by the way, it's already passed out of the House with overwhelmingly and bipartisan 392 to 20. It's now in the Senate. Would you support the legislation moving through the Senate? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to support a specific piece of legislation here, but as you've described it, we're doing this already at the SEC. We're happy to work with you. We're happy to follow the legislation, of course. If Congress tells us to do more, we'll do more. But I want you to know that we are already focused on seniors um, and making sure that, that seniors are, are having access to the products that are appropriate, not products that are inappropriate for them, and that they're not the victims of fraud. I think that's part, sir, right, of your retail strategy task force. That's that's we, have a retail, we have a retail strategy task force, but we also have people who are specifically focused on, on making sure that, and that, that seniors, um, let me put it this way, inspections, examinations, all of that, um, we have sort of a, a senior focus and um, let, me, let me try and say this in the way I'm, I, I'm able. Uh, it, it's important to understand when you look across accounts and you do surveillance and the like, whether accounts have seniors or not, which is one of the reasons why um, date of birth data or year of birth data is important um, in our oversight. Thank you. Um, time, the gentleman. Is I might have time? Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Is, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Has expired, uh, Mr. Kasten. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Chairman Clayton. If you're up to me, we're nearing the end. <laughs> um, Alexander Kearns was a college student in Naperville, Illinois, in my district, um, recently took his life. He took up trading during the COVID lockdown when he saw that his Robinhood account had a negative balance of $730,000. Now, it turns out he didn't owe that whole amount, but I want to just read you most of his suicide note that his father found. If you're reading this, then I am dead. How was a 20-year-old with no income able to get assigned almost a million dollars worth of leverage? The puts I bought slash sold should have canceled out. I have no clue what I was doing now in hindsight. There was no intention to take this much risk. Robinhood has added 3 million users in 2020. Now it's my understanding that they have made some changes to their platform and Mr. San Nicholas you know, spoke about protecting retail investors and I certainly share your view that people should not take risks they can't afford. Other than Reg BI, what is the SEC doing affirmatively to ensure that people like Alex can't get exposed like that again? Yeah. Um, we're, we, um, we and FINRA um, are looking at this kind of, of disclosure. Um, and, boy, I, I, let me just say this. I, I read that over the weekend, um, and uh, just terrible. Um, we need to do something to make sure that these kinds of things don't happen. Well, I, I guess, and I, under, I understand that you are, as you said, a disclosure-driven entity. Um, the disclosures are only as good as the understanding of the person who yeah, reads no, them. And let me just say, I agree 100% with you. Yeah. That's what I was saying before, that you know, you, you, disclosure is, all, is only good if people can understand it. Yeah. And you've got to be able to make an assessment of whether somebody can understand it. Well, I, I thank you for saying that. I, I introduced when we passed on the House floor, H.R. 1815, earlier this term, specifically to do market testings of, of those disclosures. It was with Reg BI in mind, because if people can't understand in plain English what they're signing, then we haven't done our market research well enough. And we need to get it through the Senate, but I'd encourage you to consider, you could do that by rule. Here, you take it up. I want to, I want to turn to private markets and some of what my, some of my colleague from Wisconsin was raising. Um, they require a lot less disclosure than public markets. I spent most of my career prior to getting here was running private equity-backed companies, complicated structures, very sophisticated people, constantly evolving capital structures. It was hard for me to keep up, and I was the CEO of the darn company. Um, this month, the SEC has proposed rules to expand exempt offerings in the, in the private market. And given, given the issues and, and the, the lack of total understanding in public markets, can you just help me understand why you think we are protecting investors if we are allowing greater participation in private markets by less people who would not pass the Reg D standard of a sophisticated or accredited investor? Well, I, I think we're looking at this in exactly the appropriate way um, for what you're describing. Right now, we have a wealth test or an income test to ascertain whether somebody is sophisticated or not. It's, and, and it's a binary test. I've long believed that that's not the right test. Um, but it's a test we've had. It's, it's integrated into our ecosystem. What we're doing is saying, are there better ways to test whether somebody should qualify as an accredited investor? And our proposal says one of the ways to think about it is, did you pass the Series 7 exam? Were you able to sit down and pass the kind of exam that somebody who you know, is selling securities has to pass? Do you understand things like exposure from options and the like? I, I, I believe that that kind of component of the accredited investor test uh, is important. Well, I, I agree in principle. Let me, let me shift, if I will, May, um, to an area totally outside of your jurisdiction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Department of Labor this week issued an information letter under ERISA to allow 401k plan sponsors to have private equity as a component of diversified asset allocation funds. I'm not going to ask you to speculate on ERISA, but is it your view that a 401k plan or an investor in a 401k plan would pass the sophisticated test that would allow them to participate in ways that would not frustrate the spirit of, of Section 506 of Reg D as currently written? It, but put another way, can DOL, can the Department of Labor make that change without you making a corresponding change in Reg D? Um, so the way that was structured 
is, is not directly investing in private equity by ERISA plan participants. I, I, re I read the letter. I thought it was structured very well because it was the ERISA plan fiduciary could pick a fund that has a fiduciary where the fund has limited exposure to private equity. So not direct investment by an ERISA beneficiary into private equity. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'd, I'd, we'll follow up with the offline, because I think there's a real concern that we could end up putting a lot of unsophisticated money in places that were hard for me as the CEO of the company to understand. Yeah, I, I don't want that to happen. Th thank you. Uh, Mr. Budd is now recognized virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Clayton. Uh, appreciate you being here today and uh, your capacity as chairman of the SEC. I know there's been a lot of news, very exciting news surrounding you lately. But I want to talk about uh, U.S. accounting standards um, as a critical component of U.S. capital markets, the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world. And for them to continue to operate efficiently and effectively, the U.S. must maintain accounting and reporting standards of the highest quality. This is particularly true in times of instability, similar to what we're experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you're undoubtedly aware, I've long been an outspoken critic of the Cecil accounting standard developed and implemented by FASB as an entity in which the SEC has direct supervision over. Now there were already serious concerns centered around Cecil before the start of this pandemic, and this crisis has only highlighted those concerns further. So my questions, how does the SEC validate that all new accounting standards or significant revisions to existing accounting standards have been subjected to comprehensive field testing or economic impact assessments? So uh, just wanted to get your take on that, Mr. Clayton. Well, I think, um, look, uh, I think what we should be looking at Cecil's performance um, uh, during this time period. Um, let me, let me say it from, there's two perspectives uh, on which people have been looking at Cecil and, and, uh, and how it operates. One is from a, from a regulatory capital perspective, what impact it has on regulatory capital from the bank regulators' perspective. So I'm gonna put that to the side. From, from my perspective and what Cecil uh, disclosure around uh, expected losses uh, is from the investor point of view. And we have had some, signi we have had some significant swings um, there are some things that we need to look at, including that whether different models used by comparable um, institutions produce significantly different results. If you're having um, com uh, two, two financial issuers with the same balance sheet, or a very similar balance sheet, they're coming up with different results. Uh, why is that happening? And uh, do we need to make adjustments? Is somebody using a two-year model versus a one-year model? Is somebody significantly waiting on employment in a time like this? Um, when you know unemployment is at a at a level that no one really thought it would be, um, so that's a long-winded way of saying we should look at how Cecil has performed um, in this time of stress and assess um, whether uh, guidance, etc., whatever ne needs to be made. But it's definitely something we should be looking at. Thank you. Does the SEC conduct any independent, an independent uh, assessments of investor relations to new or significantly modified accounting or reporting standards before they're finalized or issued? Uh, and if so, why or why not? Um, I think what you're getting at is um, our relationship with uh, the FAF and the FASB and their, and their independence. We, we do mm -hmm. engage with them. Um, I believe their independence is important. Um, you know, we. I think we have a, a very good relationship, and back to your Cecil point, we're going to continue to work with them um, on evaluating how Cecil has been implemented and how it's working. Thank you. Would the SEC be open to formalizing through notice and comment uh, the review process for new accounting standards? Um, I, look, I think I think the process as it as it works today is a good process. I know that people are are looking at at, at in particular, we're having this back and forth on Cecil. I think people are looking at Cecil uh, and continue to look at it with questions. But overall, I think the current process is a good process, uh, but happy to continue to, to discuss that with you. Um, I'd like to do that. It seemed that it was kind of made, it, it had the feel of being made without uh, direct input of the SEC uh, by um, an unaccountable board. So I'd, I'd like to continue that discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Does the SEC conduct independent investor outreach to validate investor considerations for accounting standards on a pre-issuance basis? Uh, and if not, would the SEC be open to such a process? So th this is something that was important to me. And as we've looked at new trustees for the FAF and the FASB, um, I've made it a point to make sure that we have that investor perspective um, so that that perspective is brought to bear on their rulemaking. And of course, they should be reaching out to people who, who are the, not just the preparers, but the users of the, of the financial statements. Very good. Uh, thanks for being here today, and I yield back my time. Thank you. I believe we now recognize Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for allowing me to be a part of this important hearing, and I thank you, Chairman Clayton, uh, for your service uh, at SEC uh, during this crisis, uh, this di terribly difficult time for our entire country. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I too would like to begin by discussing rating agencies. Uh, I'm Madeline Dean from suburban Philadelphia, by the way. Uh, last week, the Federal Reserve Chairman Powell came before our committee and he acknowledged that not all NRSROs have equal access to emergency lending facilities. Since the Credit Rate Rating Agency Reform Act of 2006 conferred sole supervisory authority of credit rating agencies to SEC, I want to raise this issue with you today. Because these lending facilities do not treat all nine of the rating agencies equally or uniformly, I'd like more insight on how the Federal Reserve came up with eligibility standards for rating agencies. You have said in earlier testimony that there has been some conversation between the Fed and SEC on this subject. Uh, can you flesh out a little more uh, what that conversation uh, looks like uh, and what, if any, recommendations were made by SEC to the Fed? So uh, I haven't been directly involved in those conversations, but let me give you my understanding of them. I, I did have a high-level conversation with one of my counterparts at the Fed. But what we've, what we've done is if you look across those nine NRSROs, some of them uh, participate in a wide variety of markets, corporates, um, products, uh, and, and the like, and, and insurance, et cetera. Some of them only participate in very narrow aspects of the markets or have very limited participation um, in a market. You, you may, I'm gonna make up these numbers, but get them directly correct. You may have the insurance industry where two or three do 90% of the insurance industry, and one or, you know, there are a couple others that do just a few companies. We, we provide that data to the, to the Fed, and then the Fed can see which NRSROs have sufficient experience to participate um, in, in the various facilities that they're using. So that's Well, that's I'm, the I'm not actually, Mr. Chairman, I'm not actually thinking about market or where they participate, because as I understand it, NRSROs must satisfy the same criteria by SEC. Um, so I'm wondering what is the internal distinction uh, being made by the Fed uh, is, it in, is it your opinion that after the SEC registers an NRSRO of a given asset class that they should be treated uniformly? Um, I, and I think that it's a really good question but because uh, it, it highlights the issue. Our registration does not qualify them for a particular asset class or not an asset class. It's just a general registration as an NRSRO. So you can have somebody who's registered with us who doesn't rate corporate debt. Um, or has no expertise in rating corporate debt. It's, it's, a, it's not a merit um, analysis of their ability or not their ability. That, that's the, I think, and I don't want to speak for the Fed. They do, they, do a, you know, they do a good job at this. They need to look at uh, the portfolio of ratings that those entities do and assess whether well, they're appropriate for their facilities. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you may know, uh, and it says bipartisan support, as you've heard today, that my bill, H.R. 6934, would help achieve this uniform treatment across the NRSROs. Uh, let me move on uh, to pick up on the conversation that you had begun here um, uh, with the very troubling uh, firing of Attorney Berman, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. You said you began a conversation with the administration only this last weekend as to the possibility of you shifting your position. Is that correct? Uh, let, me, let me be clear. The, the weekend of the 12th um, was, was the conversation, the initial conversation. Oh, okay. 
I'm sorry, the weekend before the firing of Berman. I'm sorry, that I didn't hear that. That would be the week before. Uh, Mr. That Chairman? would be the weekend before the firing of Mr. Berman. Mr. Chairman, uh, the weekend of the 12th. Her, her, her question was I, inaudible. I think she just needed, we needed to let. Please repeat your question. That would have been the weekend before the firing, the Friday night firing uh, of Mr. Berman. Yes, the weekend of the 12th. And you said you had had these conversations with others, a wish to get back to New York, so you were looking for a position back in New York. Uh, when did you begin that conversation with either Attorney General Barr or the President? As, as I said, the first time it was, was raised was the weekend of the 12th, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. It was raised by you or by, by, by me. Attorney by me. This is, this, let me be clear on this issue. This was entirely my idea. This is something that I've been thinking about for several months um, as a possible continuation of public service uh, after my time Why at the was SSS this done. Okay, and, and you're, not, you're not a history of a prosecutor, but this was your idea. Uh, so you suggested it to the administration, is that correct? Yes, I, I, uh, the, I extended the gentlelady's time a bit for the technical problem, but the uh, ranking member points out oh, that thank you. uh, you're... I, I apologize. I did not have the timer visible to me, so I apologize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, and you can submit questions for the record, and we do expect Mr. Clayton to... I will. To Thank you very much. I yield back. ...respond. And now is our last questioner, uh, the very distinguished uh, gentlelady from Texas, uh, Ms. Garcia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and as a member of the Financial Services Committee and also the Judiciary Committee, I wanted to just pick up where Ms. Dean has left. And uh, uh, Mr. Clayton, who approached you? You said it was uh, the weekend of the 12th. Uh, who approached you about it, or did you approach the administration? I just want to be clear on that. No, I, let, me, let, let, me be, let me be clear on this. Um, and, and, I, and I don't, this is not a confirmation hearing. I'm, I'm here as the chairman of the SEC, but I, I want to be clear on how this came. This was entirely my idea. It was something that I had been thinking about and talking with others as to whether I could go back to New York, which I had committed to do to my family and intend to do when I'm finished my service here and continue in public service. This was a, this was a position that was very attractive to me based on my uh, work with the Southern District and my extensive work with people who are alumni of the Southern District. It's an incredible group of people. They work incredibly hard. They're dedicated to justice without fear or favor. This was something of interest to me that came up um, the weekend of the 12th, and that's, that's, how, that's the genesis uh, for this. And, I, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. Well, unfortunately, I can't. I mean, I, I think that you understand that, that I understand and you understand this is not a confirmation hearing. But the reality is uh, that you are before Congress, you're before a committee, uh, and any time anyone comes to testify before United States Congress, they know they're subject to just about any question about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you may feel uncomfortable, you may not want to answer the questions, but until you run for a member, to be a member of Congress, I get to ask the questions. So uh, again, uh, uh, I'm going Mr. To Chairman, to parliamentary members. inquiry. Is, is this line of questioning even relevant to the title or the subject of what our, their hearing is supposed to be about? The gentlelady from Texas is correct. You're a member of Congress. It's your time. Uh, uh, if I start editing the questions and comparing it to the title and crafting the titles to exclude the questions that I don't want to hear, uh, I'm not sure you're going to be happy with the result. So it just, it just I'll add, seems to me, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the, that the, at least uh, in, a, in, in the your, your, par your parliamentary I'm inquiry has been responded to. Okay, point and of your, inquiry. And, and if you have uh, an op-ed you want to write, uh, put no, it no, in the Mr. Hill or roll call. Point of inquiry, is it, is it going to be your common practice to have discussion on issues that are outside of our... It community? is my practice as chair to recognize a member and to recognize that as a member of Congress who can ask the questions yes. they want and to protect their time from interruptions. Uh, I will ask the uh, staff to uh, restore about uh, half they, a minute. They, Mr. Chairman, okay, parliamentary inquiry on that. They paused, they stopped the clock when my inquiry started, so there is no need to add time. But the, the train of thought was certainly interrupted. So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward. I'm sorry. Uh, 
Correct. Ms. Garcia, and uh, hopefully there will be no further inquiries. You're recognized for the remainder of your time. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's regrettable that he's refusing to answer a direct question from a member of Congress. And the American people deserve to know uh, some of these questions because, yes, uh, uh, he, he did state earlier that, um, that he was not, this process did not require his current attention, the, the confirmation process. But the reality is, when you're, you're a potential nominee or you're a nominee, uh, all, it's all fair game and the American people have a right to know. But I'll move on. Uh, this Wednesday, Judiciary Committee heard from several employees uh, at the, from the Department of Justice, either current employees or, or uh, who have testified. And the department is pursuing cases based on the president's political and personal whim and not based on the rule of law. For example, Mr. Zelensky, a prosecutor on the Roger Stone investigation, testified that he was told the department wanted to lessen the sentencing recommendation for Stone because the U.S. attorney was afraid of the president and so agreed to treat Stone differently than any other person. Mr. Clayton, should the president's friends be treated differently other than defendants? Let, let me tell you how we approach matters at the SEC and how I would approach matters anywhere. It, it does not matter um, who the subjects are. You, you pursue it without fear or favor and to do justice. And that's the way that the people who have worked with me, the 1,300 people in our enforcement division at the SEC have performed it. Um, and that is the right way to go forward. Well, I agree with you. Without fear or favor is, is certainly the, the, the principle involved here. But what if you get an order? Do you believe the president has a right to tell you to lower a sentencing recommendation or drop charges entirely for his friends or for political uh, allies? I'm going to talk about at the SEC. At the SEC, what we do is we, we approach this through our enforcement directors, through our um, uh, staff. They, they are empowered to do what they think is right. Well, again, sir, I'm asking you, if you, you know, you want to be the attorney general. You, you said you've had oversight of prosecutors. You know, can you commit to us today uh, to report any political influence or any kind of undue influence coming from the White House or the president or his agents uh, to, to, to you or your office uh, as attorney general if, 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 if anything like that occurs, that you would report it to Congress? I, yeah, I can, I, can, I can commit to continuing to do my job as I have and any other job like it as I have, which is without fear or favor, with independence, and without inappropriate influence. Right. I think in response to Ms. Porter's questions, you said uh, that, that you had not had any, uh, any discussion or any kind of influence either while you were playing golf with the president or any other time. Is that right? What, I, what I'm, what I'm going to say is I have conducted myself in my job in a way that I have not had any improper influence on any enforcement matter. I'm completely confident in saying that. So you, yep. you, you are, Mr. Chairman. I think that the time of the gentlelady has expired. I, I wish I could continue to get uh, and allocate you more time, but uh, the ranking member is being assertive here. So questions. Uh, questions for the uh, record will be uh, submitted in the requisite number of days, which I believe uh, is what. Five uh, legislative days, uh, and we hope, uh, Chairman Clayton, that you can get us an answer within a few weeks, uh, a very few weeks, uh, to those written questions. Um, Mr. And, Chairman? Yes. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a June 24th letter from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to both uh, yourself and myself. Uh, the letter uh, provides comments uh, to the legislative text attached to this hearing. Apparently, they need to amend that to make this the confirmation hearing, but uh, it is on the text of this attached hearing. Without objection, the document will be entered. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Clayton for his testimony. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days in which to submit additional written questions for Mr. Clayton uh, to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for their response. I ask Mr. Clayton to please respond promptly. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days uh, in which to uh, submit extraneous materials uh, to the chair for inclusion in the record. 
I remind members to submit your written questions and materials for the record to the email address provided to your staff. And now, according to these notes, I'm supposed to hit and say we're adjourned.